Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the June meeting of Manhattan Community Board 4. Um, we're going to do a couple of things differently tonight, but I just want to let you know. Um, I have a statement I'm going to make before we ever get into the actual agenda. Um, and if there are any of the electeds on, um, we usually allow the electeds to speak um, as soon as they join us. But given the forum and given the current situation, I think it's important that we hear the public speak before we hear the electeds. So I'm going to hold all the electeds to closer to their actual spot on the agenda um, after the public session. So uh, I wanted to say something as we're getting started because we're in a really weird place right now. We're still trying to figure out a way forward in the face of COVID-19 which affected people of color disproportionately. We are reeling once again from the murder of a person of color at the hands of those meant to protect us, the police. We are facing economic devastation on a level not seen since the Great Depression as a result of the lockdowns that were necessary to control the coronavirus. And we have local businesses that have been devastated by opportunistic rioters and looters who took advantage of the chaos and disorder for their own benefit. I've been trying to make sense of all of this. And part of the way I've been doing that is by doing a lot of reading over the last week. And I read something this past weekend that I've been thinking about ever since. Um, in all honesty, I saw this plastered on the side of a car on Second Avenue. I am not black, but I see you. I am not black, but I hear you. I am not black, but I mourn with you. I am not black, but I will fight for you. As a white man of means, I've never feared the police. And until this week, I've never feared for my own son's lives. But my older son, who many of you heard me talk about multiple times, has been protesting in Washington all week. And every night I've breathed a sigh of relief when he tells me he made it home okay. I've thought, is this how mothers and fathers of black children feel every night, scared they won't make it home because of police violence? I've wondered what I would have done if I had been on the Minneapolis street and con confronted four racist police officers. Would they have listened to me differently because I am white? Would I have been able to use my privilege to save George Floyd's life? I honestly don't know, but I like to think I would have tried. What all of my reading and thinking has led me to conclude is that we're facing multiple traumas now because, we, because of a lack of leadership, a lack of leadership at the federal level and a lack of leadership from city hall. I think as community leaders, even if this board only functions in advisory capacity, there are things we can do to make life better for everyone in our city. First of all, as many of you know, earlier in the pandemic, Eric Botcher coordinated a food drive through donations raised from Friends of the High Line and IAC to provide pa pantry stable food to those in need. I am pleased to announce that the Hell's Kitchen Hudson Yards Alliance, led by our former district manager, Bob Benfato, has to date secured enough funding for CB4 and Eric to have another 500 boxes of pantry stable food to deliver. Next, I think there's an action we can take tonight. I'm going to propose a new business letter to Mayor de Blasio, imploring him to have the NYPD focus on preventing looters and rioters and leaving peaceful protesters alone. I don't know if, how many of you know this, but there was a lot of rioting in Chelsea and the eyewitness reports from the people who were there say that the police did absolutely nothing. They were on scene and drove by, or they reported that they were deployed elsewhere. Um, they should be focused on protecting us, not focusing on peaceful protesters. Additionally, I'm going to convene a working group to explore what recommendations we can make to the mayor to combat the institutional racism of the NYPD. I want to be very clear. I am not condemning every police officer out there but there's an inherent bias in the organization that city leaders have not eliminated. There are some obvious answers that have already been suggested, such as repealing the protections of Section 50A of the New York Civil Rights Law that prevents public disclo disclosure of a police officer's disciplinary history. But I am certain we can come up with more. The working group will prepare a list of recommendations in the form of a letter to the mayor for adoption by the full board at our July meeting. I will also expect the working group to make any other recommendations for actions that CB4 can take on all forms of discrimination, whether through hosting community forums or other actions that are appropriate for a community board. Importantly, 
I know me and the people in charge, the leaders of this board don't always have the right answers. So I'm asking for new and diverse voices to join this working group. Finally, I'm going to ask our small business working group to reconvene, led by Bert Lazarin, to investigate measures to help small businesses in our district that have suffered losses, whether due to coronavirus, looting, or otherwise. I would like to see those recommendations as soon as possible. We are the most local form of city government for a small corner of our great city. But in the absence of leadership from the mayor on issues that have the potential to permanently destroy the social fabric of life in New York, we all need to collectively step up. All right, I get off my soapbox now. We go to the public session. No, we go to the, we have a presentation tonight. Um, and our departing board member, Inga Evchenko, is going to lead us through this and discuss this. Inga is, has resigned from the board effective as of midnight tonight. Um, because of new work engagement, but she will be a public member of the Business Licensing and Permits Committee. So Inga, the floor is yours. Hey, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I will still be around. Um, thank you, Lowell, and thank everyone. I just wanna read a short statement about the Avenue School, um, just to kind of, if some of you don't know exactly what they are, um, Avenue's the World School exists to develop future worldwide, lead, worldwide leaders uniquely equipped to understand and solve global scale problems. They provide transformative world-focused learning experience in key cities and countries around the globe, enabling their graduates to strive during a time of unprecedented and accelerating challenge and change. Avenue's New York campus is based in Chelsea, Manhattan, and is part of a growing global network of campuses, including um, Sao Paulo, Brazil, Shenzhen in China, and Avenues Online. Avenues community values are composed of three pillars, welcome, safety, and respect. These pillars are universally honored by students, parents, alumni, faculty, and staff across the Avenues campuses. As a community board member, a neighbor, an MC before member, I actually have see how, see how the avenues have changed and made a real effort to become part of the neighborhood. Credit should also go to Morgan Jones as Director of Community Engagement and Partnerships. I've lived through a few of his predecessors and they didn't really connect. Um, since Morgan joined, they're accessible, they're always available, he's committed to community engagement, and while COVID-19 has been a tragedy, tragedy and touched us all, it allowed avenues to actually shine as a beacon of hope, helpfulness, and leadership. I'm really very confident that they will continue to be a vital part of the community. Their generosity, the students, the parents, the staff, their kindness will go way beyond 2020, and hopefully the world will be a better place. I, for one, am glad they're our neighbors. And just a couple of the things that they have done, they were able to provide 250 care packages to families in temporary shelters in our districts. Um, during COVID, that was a really difficult time for those people. They jumped in on a letter writing campaign and made it part of their curriculum to the emergency workers. They donated money to the EMT in, in Chelsea, the local, and they also sent food to emergency workers all over the city to different hospitals and that's just a small part of what they're doing and they just keep asking what can we do to help so good for you thank you and i know they're here yeah definitely they have really shined thank you so much thank you thank you um Thank you, community board four. Thank you, Inga. Uh, you'll be missing the board um, uh, as well. Um, firstly, my name is Morgan Jones. I'm director of community engagement and partnerships uh, with Avenues. And I wanna thank you for this commendation uh, with regards to our response uh, to COVID-19. Um, uh, I, I also wanna recognize a few of my colleagues that are also on the line. Our head of school, Dr. Evan Glazer, our director of operations, uh, Daniel Greenblatt, um, Director of People and Culture, Becca Howlett, Director of Global Journeys, Kevin Marungi, Aaron Geld from our marketing team, 
um, teachers, Maria Doyle and Nime Yeah. Um, you know, they did also a lot of work. It took a team effort. There's many others that might be on this call as well, too, that are watching you all from avenues that are from the community, that are outside of the community, that are across the nation or across the world right now watching this. So thank you so much for, for having us on for here. Um, I'm not going to speak too much. Um, what I'm going to do is let the students do some of the talking. So uh, without further ado, I want to introduce Ava Layden, an 11th grader who made 500 masks with 25 student volunteers and faculty, all donated to community groups within Community Board 4, um, as well as a brief video that Jesse will show here um, of our fifth grade Girl Scouts, who also raised a fundraiser and um, got some funding out to groups uh, also within Community Board 4, as well as some citywide related initiatives. So I will kick it off to Ava to unmute and give a few words. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me and recognizing all the work that Avenues has done to support our community during this time. Without help from Mr. Jones and my mastery teacher, Mr. Rakowski, I would not have been able to grow this mass project to the extent that we did. The goal of the project was to bring together Avenues students to make face masks due to the limited amount of PPE. The Avenues community, both staff and students, worked extremely hard in between work and school to achieve our goal of making and distributing 500 masks. We donated them to the Elliott Chelsea Houses, the Fulton Houses, and St. Clement's Food Pantry, all within CB4. It was inspiring to watch everyone work and develop 500 masks as I initially thought this goal was impossible. The project has given me a sense of fulfillment during this pandemic as I was able to help those around me and bring our communities together. Lastly, I would like to thank Mr. Rakowski and Mr. Jones for encouraging me to lead the volunteers and not giving up until we reached our goal. Thank you. Then I'll kick it off to Jesse for the video. <laughs> Oops. Hi, we're fifth grade Girl Scout Troop 3762. This year, we have been working to earn our bronze award, where we are challenged to help out our community. Originally, we were helping the ACC, New York's animal shelter system. But once the pandemic started, we wanted to find a new way to help. We decided to organize virtual animal trivia nights to educate people about animals in a fun way and to help people feel connected while we're all at home. A lot of people came, even some of our teachers. The first place winner helped us donate $1,000 that we earned selling cookies this year. We donated $500 to our school essential workers program, fedding lunch from local restaurants to more than 250 medical workers, including Mount Sinai West. We also donated $500 to the Holy Apostles Soup Kitchen. Being home isn't easy, but it didn't stop us from helping others. We appreciate you letting us share our project tonight. Thank you for all you do. So yeah, thank you so much for having us. There are many other ways. <laughs> thank you. There, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, uh, it's really all the students, you know, and, and our faculty and the team effort. There are many other ways we've been working with the community during COVID-19. We also called seniors in the community, um, mainly in Spanish, Mandarin, and Cantonese, but some of you here and some community leaders as well too. And we've used some of our classes to do so. And we donated a lot of care packages. Actually, the care package number increased, Inga, increased to 360 um, is what we did for um, some of the shelters in, in the area as well, too. And, I, and honestly, it really was about asking the community board for reaching out to you all and asking where we could help um, and really just responding to a need as opposed to just, you know, we want to work with the community and do all that work. So it's really hopefully, you know, it's an honor to serve and continuously and selflessly with you all, especially in light of everything that's going on right now. And uh, we look forward to that continued partnership with you all as well. So thank you for having us. Thank you. And you make community engagement real at Avenues. So thank you. Thank you very much, Morgan. Thank you, Ava. Um, I'm looking at those two proud people behind you, Ava. Um, just wondering who they might be. I can't figure it out. Um, and Morgan, thank you again so much. I feel a little bit better about our long-term future than I do about our short-term future right now. Um, all right, we have to keep moving. Um, the next part up is the public session. 
And I will turn the floor over to our first vice chair, Jeffrey LaFrancois. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I echo the sentiments about feeling much better about the long-term uh, situation than the short. Um, that was fantastic. So thank you for that, Avenues and Inga, for bringing this to our attention. I'll be running the public session this evening. And my headphones just died. I'll be running the public session this evening. Um, as usual, uh, you'll have, folks will have two minutes to speak on a topic of their choosing. Uh, before members of the board. And as you also know, we're streaming um, to the public via YouTube as well. Um, we have had, we've had folks that signed up in advance um, to speak. And so I'll start by calling their names first um, and we will take it from there. We do anticipate some folks might not have signed up in advance. Um, and if you haven't, um, please raise your hand um, and we will take it accordingly. Um, Let's see here. Sorry, I'm one of my many. Jeffrey, can I jump in real quickly? Yes, please, Jesse. Uh, if any of the folks that have signed up are calling in on the on a phone line, we won't be able to recognize that it's you. So um, uh, star six unmutes you, and you should be able to, you know, uh, identify yourself. Um, uh, and if you did sign up and you did, are calling up on a phone line, you can press star nine by, and that will virtually raise your hand and we'll be able to find you and be able to bring you in and have you speak. Thank you, Jesse. Um, so with that, I'm gonna call um, two speakers at a time. So we have somebody waiting in the wings as well. Um, Denise Williams is first followed by Nick Platt. Denise? I don't have Denise in my in the attendee section unless she's calling in. Like I said, Denise, if you want to press star six and unmute yourself, if that's, if that's one of you. Is Nick around? Do you see him, Jesse? I do not see him either, unless he is under a different name. <clears throat> All right. I do. Uh, how about Larry Roberts? Is Larry on your list? I believe Larry is here. So let me move Larry up into panelist. There we go. So we should all be able to see Larry. Larry, you can unmute yourself if you're, once you're here. Can you guys hear me? Hi, Larry. Go ahead. I'm gonna hey, start. Everyone. Um, I'm here to speak about item 10 out of the transportation committee. Um, I wanted to know whether there was any kind of research or homework done before the vote to send a letter to the governor asking for a bike lane on the West Side Highway. As many of you know, it's already extremely congested. I couldn't imagine eliminating one of the southbound lanes the way the West Side Highway is currently designed. To me, it would be just plain foolish. There seems to be little or no thought put into some of these community initiatives. In April, it proposed a bunch of streets to be included in the open streets plan without any kind of homework done. One of those, West 51st Street, was in an open late last week. It became a block party, pictures of which were widely distributed on the internet. There's many bars on 9th Avenue. It's, uh, they're salivating for the opportunity to be adjacent to one of these streets does not work in the 40s and 50s in health kitchen, and I would hope you'd reconsider this. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Um, Carla Fine. Is Carla here, Jesse? Yes, Carla's being moved up to panelists now. Uh, are you with us? Hello? Hi, Carla. Hi, Carla. Hear you. Hi. Um, thank you for having this meeting. I'm, well, I want to talk about um, the response of the uh, 10th uh, police precinct, uh, not for the recent looting um, that was on Monday, but it was a, several days before that there was an incident at Clement Clark Moore Park 
which is across the street from where I live. And there were around um, 12 um, young men who came into the park illegally with dirt bikes um, wearing, I want to just say red caps, and screaming horrible things and taking their bikes up and down on the, all the park, um, the playground, everything, and screaming at people who were trying to tell them what they, that they were ruining everything. I called 911, I called 311, I called the NCO. I wasn't the only one. So this went from five to six o'clock. There was no response from the 10th precinct from anyone. We kept on calling, calling, taking pictures. And finally, one hour later, uh, a police car came down 10th Avenue uh, with the sirens on. So the, and I can't call them kids because they were young men um, in their 20s, or I don't know, started throwing their bikes over the fence. And the cop car just rolled on by and watched them, did not stop and, um, and let them do this. Um, many people were horrified um, by this. And so um, I called up, I put a complaint into the precinct. And then afterwards, when this happened on Monday with the looting, and people had the same response that it took them an hour to get, you know, to the looting on 9th Avenue and 8th Avenue and in the, in the Chelsea neighborhood. Um, I, I just wanted to put an official complaint in. I don't understand why it, was, it would take one hour. Um, and this was a possibly volatile situation because uh, these young men did not seem like they were from the neighborhood and were extremely, um, uh, um, what would they were cursing at, at all the people who were telling them to get out. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. <clears throat> did you find it, Nick, or did Denise, Jesse? If not, we'll move to John Mandel, who's raised his hand in the attendees section. Um, no, I still have not have any. No, Nick is here and no Denise. So we can move to, um, uh, oh, he took, where is John? John just seemed to have put his hand down. Hey. John, was that an accident? No, I think that was an accident. Let me move him to panelist. Okay. John, do you hear us? I can hear you, can you hear me? Yes. I have uh, the beard for Zoom meeting, so apologies in advance uh, for my physical appearance here. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to chat. Jesse, of course, uh, for your responsiveness and uh, you know, identifying this as an opportunity to speak about uh, our quote unquote open street for the 400 West 51st Street uh, block. As someone else mentioned previously, um, there was a huge party on Saturday, um, about 100 people, roughly, um, undermining the whole intent of the purpose, not wearing masks, not social distancing. Um, everyone was drinking, uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, one of the things that's, you know, troubling is uh, one of the biggest culprits was the bar across the street, Posh, which I had spoken to previously. Uh, my experience, the owner has not been a very good neighbor. Uh, people have raised complaints before about noise and other issues. Uh, and he's just been very receptive to the problems. And frankly, we, I would love to see a lot of these local businesses receive the support that they need. Um, the rules are quite clear that you need to get drinks with food purchases and take them to go. I recognize that some bars are just selling the drinks without food. Uh, frankly, Posh has never sold food in my recollection. I've never seen anyone eat food at the bar or leave with food. Uh, you know, I am open to the idea of the governor and frankly, all the other agencies reducing the guidelines to allow people to take drinks only to go, but that's not the rules. And I frankly think, and I hope the community board agrees, that you know, bad neighbors shouldn't be rewarded with you know looking the other way on this issue. 
and frankly, I hope that you know the community board can support those of us who live here uh, and find a solution to this problem, whether it's actual enforcement of the rules or when the authorities are called uh, to make sure that the you know it gets the proper attention it needs. Um, you know, again, I hope to contribute in any way, be you know some some sort of you know good neighbor in this process and recognizing that businesses are also struggling. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, John. <clears throat> As was noted in the comments, uh, Mr. Mills is not gonna be speaking this evening. So unless there is anybody else, uh, excuse me, we have another person, Greg Lynn, Jesse? Yep, I'm moving him up now. Thank you. Greg, do you hear us? Something happened to Greg Lynn. Greg, are you there? So can you hear me now? Uh, we sure can. Great, thank you so much. Two minutes on the uh, clock. Great, uh, so Greg Lynn, 49 to 54 block association. I wanted to comment on two items, the first, the street closure and open uh, such on 50, West 51st Street. Although I do appreciate um, the open street um, and the community does as well, I think the issue that came to amount was the notification even too posh of what was actually happening. I received notification that on Saturday morning that we were now eligible to have a street closure. The barricade went up and there was no signage. I personally, signed and put signs up on 51st and stood there for almost two days, letting the community know what actually was happening. People wanted to comply. They just didn't know what was going on. Um, as somebody who lives right down the street, as we implement things, um, it is a quiet street. Posh, even the people themselves that day didn't know what was going on and they complied every day, closing their store at 8 p.m. and serving food in addition to some of the others. So as we do consider um, some of the businesses and we think that they might be taking advantage of the situation, or even the sense of when we are uh, belittering people for coming together on a open street that was our first open street, which is one of the quietest streets. It also is one where from a perspective of two of the residential buildings, it's their back entrance. I think we need to understand that when we implement stuff, the community needs to know in advance we need to have proper signage and we also need to have a plan because again, community members here want to comply. The community wants to comply. People that support those businesses want to comply. They just don't even know. They don't know. Um, I mean, at 8 PM for the first two or three days, it was it, people in the community taking away the barricade, not the police. Second issue is on the, regarding the shelters. Um, especially the temporary ones. We are very much inundated. Uh, we, I know there was a, a discussion before, and I, I did participate on it regarding the 51st Street location, but right after that, the Watson Hotel came, then the Blakely came. We do want to support them, but there is notification, and there's even ways in which we're finding out from the community before it even happens, but not being notified. The Edison Hotel apparently is now going to have an, potentially be one, and that has 800 beds. Thank you, Mr. Lynn. So I would, again, just want to appreciate notification. Absolutely, and just so you know, both of the items you spoke on will be addressed during the chair's report. So please um, stay through that uh, to hear some uh, answers to your questions. Um, let's see. I have one more, Jesse. Dave Duke. Moving them up now. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? We can. Okay, great. So, Too so much on the clock. So I just want to jump in also about the, the lane closure on the West Side Highway for the cyclists. I, I just think it's something that really needs to be thought about being reconsidered because there's a lot of folks who don't only drive and have a, a car in the city for recreational purposes, 
There's a lot of folks with a car in the city who, who need to get in and out of work. And I just don't, I, I don't feel that uh, closing, a street, uh, closing a lane down on that highway for a cycling lane is appropriate. And I just hope that it's reconsidered. Thank you. We appreciate your brevity and for joining us this evening. Thank you. With that, uh, Mr. Chair, we have no other signups and no other blue hands. So thank you, everybody. I declare the public session closed. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, I said I wanted to wait until after the public spoke to let the elected speak. Um, I see at least one of our elected officials on. Um, I did see him. Uh, Assembly Member Gottfried, are you still with us? There you are. There I am. The, fl the floor is yours, Dick. Thank you. Um, so, uh, let's see, today is Wednesday. Tuesday morning, we started getting some very urgent reports in my district office uh, about the, uh, the looting and violence uh, in Chelsea, particularly around 9th Avenue and 20th Street, uh, Monday night. Uh, it very from based on the eyewitness reports this had nothing to do with protest peaceful or otherwise uh this apparently was simply uh criminal looting very organized uh by people who were just taking advantage uh of the situation uh the the photos that we've seen are really very troubling and nothing we should ever have to see um, we've, uh, we immediately, uh, wrote to, uh, uh, emailed, uh, the 10th precinct, uh, reciting all of what, uh, people had told us, uh, and how there had really not been, uh, anything like an effective response, uh, from the precinct. Uh, apparently patrol cars arrived about an hour after people had reported uh, the looting and, and after it was uh, long done and the perpetrators were were off to wherever they went. Uh, and all of this in an, on, a, on, a, on, a, on blocks that are about a block and a half from the precinct station. Um, this has got to, this has got to not happen again. Uh, obviously we don't want the looting to ever happen again, but when things like this happen, whether it's looting or other kinds of uh, problems, uh, the response uh, from the police uh, has to be a lot quicker. Um, the Assembly and Senate are planning on convening in Albany. Well, some will be in Albany. Most of us will be uh, convening remotely in session to take up a collection of bills uh, dealing with the issue of uh, police reform. Uh, you know, I really believe that the vast majority of our police officers are really dedicated public servants. Uh, they run towards danger on our behalf. Uh, but there is a minority that, that dishonor uh, themselves and, and their colleagues. Um, I might note that you could say the same for public officials. Uh, there are some who dishonor themselves uh, and all their colleagues. Uh, and we need laws to deal with that. Uh, we will be taking up uh, next week an agenda of bills uh, dealing with police reform. One that has gotten a lot of attention is repeal of something called Section 50A. It is Section 50A of all things of the, of the state civil rights law. Uh, it basically makes confidential all police personnel records. So if an officer has a, uh, a record as long as your arm of, of abuse and misconduct, uh, that can never come uh, to public attention. Uh, as far as I know, there is no state in the union with a law like that. Uh, many of you know I've been in the legislature for a while. I was one of the very few legislators who in 1976 uh, voted against the enactment of 50A, and I've been in favor of repealing it ever since. I'm a co-sponsor of the bill that I hope will become law this coming week, uh, at long last, to uh, 
to repeal it along with and 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 several other bills on uh, on police reform. Uh, moving on to another topic, we, with COVID-19, there has been a, uh, a major problem uh, with the spread of COVID-19 COVID in our nursing homes. Uh, they are, uh, you know, as uh, Governor Cuomo said, it's like, you know, lighting a, a spark in a field of dry grass. Um, unfortunately, uh, the situation is is as serious as it is in large part because of decades of state policy and, and practice uh, in relation to nursing homes, uh, tolerating serious understaffing in our nursing homes, uh, the state's uh, core of inspectors in nursing homes has long been uh, seriously understaffed and the whole enforcement effort uh, has been lax for as uh, as long as I know, uh, and that's got to change. Uh, we will be holding a pub public hearings. Uh, we, meaning the Assembly Health Committee that I chair, working with the Senate uh, Health Committee, uh, we will be holding hearings on this issue uh, very soon. I think we all got that ticket. It's, alert. Yes. it's, it's uh, the alert that they the, uh, know, uh, that in an hour we will have a curfew, I guess. Um, yes. And the last thing I want to talk about is taxes. Um, as I think I've said before at board four meetings, uh, New York has a serious problem uh, caused by the fact that we do not adequately tax uh, ultra high wealth. Um, I don't know that there's anybody on board four uh, who is over uh, taxed, um, but there are, an, or I'm sorry, uh, I doubt there is anyone on board four who is, who is under taxed. Uh, a whole lot of us are over taxed. And a large part of the reason for that is that New York under taxes high wealth. And as a result, working people in New York are over taxed and because somebody has to pay the taxes and if we don't tax high wealth the rest of us get stuck with it and to make matters worse we are underserved when it comes uh to health care and education and mass transit and housing and a whole host of other things um and i have been working with a growing coalition of legislators uh saying enough is enough it is long past time uh for us to uh raise seriously more revenue uh, from high wealth in New York uh, so that we can deal with the, the economic consequences of COVID-19 uh, as well as deal with the long-standing uh, lack of adequate services that New Yorkers have been suffering with uh, for, for many, many, many years. Uh, I was uh, the co-author of an op-ed uh, in this morning's New York Daily News, co-signed by a, a professor at CUNY, uh, focusing on the uh, the need for more revenue uh, to rescue CUNY uh, in particular. Um, that's what I wanted to say. Uh, I don't know if you want me to take questions this evening. Uh, I can certainly understand it with your agenda, uh, if you'd rather not. I see Dale has his hand up. Go ahead, Dale. Thank you for your comments and all your work. Um, I'm especially concerned about what we're seeing in New York with the NYPD in particular. There have been reports all over the country of, of, of an organized movement uh, of accelerationism, which is a white nationalist tactic to benefit from the uh, murder by police and the subsequent protests. And so I think it's, and it seems like there are, uh, uh, there, well, there are the instigators and there's also cooperation within police departments around the country. So this is a very volatile situation that we're dealing with. Uh, that is certainly true. Uh, I believe there are uh, unfortunately extremists on both the left and the right. Uh, who are 
working to try to inflame this situation. I'm, I think we are all particularly concerned about uh, the provocations and violence being instigated on the right, because uh, those are folks who are heavily armed, many of them, uh, and it seems determined uh, to provoke uh, not only racial and other violence, uh, but to do so for the purpose of advancing uh, a fascist regime in this country. Uh, and by the way, anybody who thinks, as people used to say, quote, it can't happen here, uh, should dig out a copy, you can buy it online for next to nothing, of Sinclair Lewis's 1935 novel called It Can't Happen Here, about the election of a presidential candidate, very much like Donald Trump, who proceeds to turn the United States into a fascist dictatorship. It was a scary book when I read it when I was in high school. It's even more scary uh, to read it today. Uh, and not only what we're seeing in the, in, in the current rioting, but the things we've been seeing coming out of the White House uh, for years and many other areas uh, is, is very, very frightening. And we all need to pay attention and, and respond. All right. Thank you very much, Dick. Appreciate your time. Appreciate you being here. Um, I'm going to go to the other side of the state capitol, Senator Brad Hoylman. Uh, hello. Good to see you. Uh, good to see everyone. Um, uh, Maya is on the Zoom as well. It's good to know that, that Dick was one of the original um, no votes on 58. That's amazing. That, that's, that actually is so in inspiring, Dick, um, that, that you were fighting for um, transparency and public accountability of the police all the way back then. So uh, I want to thank you for that. Um, this has been, uh, in part, um, agonizing and inspiring, I think, for all of us. Uh, well, I want to thank you for your words at the beginning uh, that I caught uh, in your um, initiative to discuss race. Um, it's so important that we have this conversation. And it's so important, frankly, that white people listen. You know, that's, that's what I'm committed to do um, during this time is really just listen. Listen to uh, the voices of black uh, constituents and New Yorkers and Americans, because I think that's something we haven't done um, enough. Um, happy Pride also. Um, and of course, you know, the, the confluence of, of Pride and the Black Lives Matter movement and um, even the, the tragedies that, that we've seen, um, George Floyd, you know, Eric Gardner, the list is long, uh, but it has something to do with you know, the original 1969 Stonewall movement, which began with riots uh, and a rebellion about police brutality, uh, led by people like Marsha P. Johnson, a trans black woman. Um, so we have a lot to be proud of uh, in our district, in our neighborhood, um, but a lot of work to do um, in connection with that. So I'm, Lowell, I'm really glad you're sparking that conversation at the local level. Um, I want to just say a few more words about, uh, to follow up with what Dick said about our work in Albany next week. Um, I'm, I'm headed up there um, as well. Um, we're looking at a package of bills that, that are going to take on the issue of police brutality and racial injustice. Um, in particular, I'm looking forward to overturning that 50A and, you know, Hopefully, Dick will be able to vote in favor of, of, a, of the bill, um, as will I. That's so important that, that police records be transparent. Um, they're public officials. They take on a great deal of responsibility. It is a shame that it's taken so long uh, for New York to get it right, but I hope, hope it's an uplifting moment for all of us. And it's a response to what we're seeing 
uh, on our streets, uh, the peaceful protests um, that have gone up and down my blocks, um, that have been across our Senate district. And I participated in a lot of those. I was out in Staten Island this weekend at the original um, location where, where Eric Garner lost his life at the hands of a policeman. And um, Gwen Carr, his mother was there and it was an incredibly moving experience. Um, I'm happy to say also that um, uh, one of the bills I sponsor, um, the Police Stat Act, it's called, is hopefully gonna be on the Albany agenda and voted on by both the Assembly and uh, the Senate. Um, this bill would, for the first time, um, require the collection of specific uh, information about individuals who are charged um, for misdemeanor offenses, um, including um, ethnicity. Um, and um, we think this is important because that information has never been collated and available to the public or to the press, nor has another part of the bill, which is important, which is requiring local police offices to report when an individual in custody dies. Uh, shockingly, also not available thus far to the public to public officials or the press. We're gonna change that with this legislation called the Peace Static. So I'm very proud of my team for getting that bill. Um, it's been in the Senate and Assembly for a number of years. The Assembly, to their credit, have passed it uh, several times. Um, and uh, we're going to pass it, uh, I hope, next week, um, as well as look at more comprehensive legislation like a um, inspector general, um, hopefully having um, having a ban on that um, on that procedure that that killed um, uh, Floyd and, and, and Garner, the, the infamous chokehold. Hard to believe that that police forces are allowed to to perpetrate um, that victimization on um, individuals who, um, who they suspect of, you know, crimes as insignificant as passing off a counterfeit $20 bill. You know, there are a lot of white people who forge a lot more than $20 uh, and never even see a day in incarceration, much less lose their lives. So this conversation is so incredibly important. So, I hope next week, under the leadership of uh, uh, Andrew Stewart Cousins in the Senate, the first um, you know, black uh, woman, the first um, uh, uh, a woman to lead a legislative chamber, uh, we'll, we'll get that done. Um, so thank you, thank you for your support on those bills. I want to mention um, also um, I've been calling for um, the the police to move resources uh, from their surveillance of uh, the protesters to protecting our personal property. And I, I, I co-signed the letter with, with Assemblymember Gottfried um, to urge the, our local precincts to protect property. The protesters are doing a good job by themselves. I don't think they need the hundreds of police uh, monitoring them. I do think some of our neighborhoods, our side streets, need a little more attention um, during these um, during these kind of offshoots that have resulted in some unfortunate looting. And so I want to support the board's concern and uh, uh, Dick's letter, and also the protesters who, if anything, need protection by the police. Um, uh, finally, um, on COVID, uh, which Dick mentioned, was our was our package. Uh, last week I had uh, four bills in that package of uh, 31 bills that we passed. Uh, one of the bills would, uh, would allow the prospective COVID-19 uh, vaccination to be more widely available in the hands of pharmacists. I'm very concerned um, that vaccination rates have dropped significantly particularly of children, uh, something like one half during this uh, pandemic, because understandably parents are, they don't want to take their kids into a doctor's office. But also there's some 
data showing that um, Americans are going to be reluctant to take to get a COVID vaccine. Well, we need the vaccine to be widely available. This bill will allow now, hopefully, a law soon will allow pharmacists to administer it, and you're supposed to get it for free. Um, secondly, a bill I passed is called the Tenant Safe Harbor Act. I think folks know that we passed a a bill, really the first step in protecting tenants uh, impacted economically by COVID-19. Uh, probably Dick spoke about it, I might have missed it, but um, it will take advantage of $100 million through the uh, Federal CARES Act to provide rental assistance. Um, a companion bill to that is a bill that I sponsored, uh, the Tenant Safe Harbor Act, which prevents tenants from being evicted during um, the New York on pause period. So if you have arrears on your uh, rent uh, and you qualify uh, as an individual whose income has been uh, impacted during the period, uh, you will not uh, be evicted. Uh, a good first step, we got to do more depending on federal money. And as Dick says, we got to come up with our own resources if the feds don't step up. Uh, God knows what's going to happen out of Washington. Um, the third bill, um, I passed um, is uh, uh, is focused on um, uh, COVID uh, workplace safety, and uh, finally um, we did a um, extension. I think importantly of the Child Victims Act. I think folks know if they remember, I've talked about this bill that I passed last year that allows um, adult survivors of child sexual abuse. Um, one year to file claims against their abusers or the institutions that may have protected those abusers uh, because the courts have been cl closed and because everyone's life, including those of survivors, uh, have been turned upside down by the pandemic. Um, we're giving survivors more time to file those claims, in fact, an entire year more. So the original Child Victims Act expires on August 14th of this year. We're going to give them until August 14th of next year to file those claims. I consider that, you know, uh, a silver lining to this to this uh, pandemic. Given that, I think getting the word out to survivors has been difficult. And um, it's very challenging, as I understand it, for a survivor of sexual abuse to, you know, to find a lawyer, to take on a trusted family member or coach or pastor, um, and it's, it's daunting. So this will give survivors more time to do that. Um, that's, my, um, that's my summary of, um, of my work. I have recently called on the local district attorneys uh, not to dismiss cases um, of peaceful protesters during, the, during, this, uh, um, during these marches. Um, or, you know, the fact that they're getting booked and, and, and photographed and arraigned is, is really, I think, antithetical to what this protest is about. Um, as well as, you know, again, the police should be spending, and our court system should be spending uh, their time on uh, serious violations. But thanks, everyone. Again, finally, continue to uh, reach out to me and Maya. Um, we're a resource on unemployment insurance. I hope if anyone has an unemployment insurance claim, we've helped. If you haven't, um, you know, give us a nudge. Uh, the State Department of Labor is doing a better job as it pertains to that. We're you know, thrilled that the number of deaths, while it's so tragic and every death is such a heartache, uh, is continues to drop below 50 now uh, as of yesterday, as well as hospitalizations. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm hopeful for an opening up, fearful that, uh, um, you know, the, the marches uh, might result in a flare up, but um, I have seen for the most part, and I participated, as I mentioned, in a number of marches, uh, a very healthy social distance uh, to the extent possible. And most marchers are wearing masks. Um, so um, that's, that's the good news. So. Uh, we'll continue to monitor it. Uh, we'll having outdoor dining opening soon. Uh, I think you know that I've sponsored a bill to allow the continuation of delivery of alcohol to try to give some of our restaurants a, a leg up as they exit this COVID crisis with community board input. 
It's a new role for the community board, uh, which I you know, strongly support uh, to hear from our boards on these important issues involving SLA. Everyone stay well um, and you know, support, support our neighbors uh, during this tough time. Thanks, Will. Thank you, Senator. Um, from Albany to Center Street, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I just came back from a, a press conference with Community Board 12, and you, you should be very proud, as you always are, of all your fellow chairs. This one was a situation where in Washington Heights, some young uh, Latinos were trying to make sure the stores were safe. And some African-American youth from Harlem came through not doing anything. And the young Dominicans were upset and called the black youth names. That's not what we want. But the good news is that today, they were all together at a press conference with council member Rodriguez, Senator Espe uh, Congressman Espiat and others. And Board 12 was the one that put everybody together. So, you know, there's so many roles that you play. This was a hugely important one. And I don't think that'll happen again. But I just want to say, just to give an example of the many roles that community boards play. Um, just like Senator Horlman, we've been at a lot of rallies. We're very supportive of the protesters. Um, I am, I did tour the meatpacking with the wonderful Jeffrey or Francois and also Soho with the bid in the last couple of days. And, you know, it's plywood, <coughs> didn't want. But I have to say, I think I was helpful because the impact last night was positive on the individuals who were protesting before and even after the curfew. But I did suggest to the uh, folks who are making decisions that they try to close down some of the bridges and tunnels and they did do that because one of the challenges was that nothing to do with new york youth but youth from other locations around the metropolitan area were coming in in vans and cars i think you know that they were even covering over the license plates well, let's see what happens tonight but um they're, they're, i think it's better but i you know we, we got to figure out who knows what's going to happen on monday the more open, the better. Number two, just like others, we're all working on outdoor space, supportive of making sure that all outdoor space is used. I know you're doing the same. Um, in terms of COVID, the one thing I wanna mention, I don't know if it'll help with the tracing, but we did contact the Department of Environmental Protection, which has 14 large sewer treatment plants. In other parts of the world, the waste, our waste is being tallied as a, perhaps an indicator of this virus. Who knows? But I think that's something that we hope DEP will in fact support us on, something to look at in addition to the tracing and the testing. Um, we're all still working on the food. I think we'll be working on food and security for a while, particularly for the seniors. Uh, like all, I always thank Fresh Direct, um, but I, we do need to stop. We've written and there have been press on the issue of don't leave the food in the lobbies. You have to, as a taxi or as a delivery person, take it to the person. Um, I understand that in some locations, we're now writing the names on the box. We have to do that. You cannot leave food for people in their lobby for somebody else, or it could disappear. We know that. <laughs> we're all um, fighting for the arts. Um, the Uptown community on the arts, you are the center of the arts along with Board 5. Um, in the world. Um, the the uh, Uptown Arts groups to meet every two weeks, virtually, of course, hundreds and hundreds of people on a phone call from the large to the small. And I think it makes a difference, something that maybe you want to think about, because I don't think Broadway, and Broadway is generally a, a, a synonymous with the larger sense of the arts, may not open as terms of theater until maybe January or March of next year. And I think that the individuals, and there are some on the board, uh, really need support. So we hope that there'll be contact tracers. I can't imagine a better person than somebody who's an actor. So we're pushing for that. But I also know that the Actors Fund, and you know the wonderful Barbara Davis, a uh, former board member, they are giving out uh, support to individuals who are 
uh, in the acting and, and uh, entertainment world, but not able to work. So just be aware of that. I want to just add, just like everybody else, we're fighting for SYEP, and I think the city council will do that. We're also working with the Police Athletic League, and they're going to be supportive of maybe 100 young people hiring during the summer. I'm very concerned about the schools, uh, whether it's District 2 or District 5, all of them. There will be 178,000 people in summer school. We're trying to get tutors uh, who are uh, signed up by the Department of Education and vetted. Because I think if you have the same experience you had during the year, you're not going to have a great experience during the summer. And um, obviously, I'm a supporter of social workers more than ever, full time, culturally appropriate for every school. And I, I must admit, I keep saying this over and over again. And then DOP said, oh, good idea. But then they don't allocate the funding. And I can't imagine a better allocation. I do want to thank, um, you know, certainly Brian Lewis, and everybody in our staff, because I know you've been working on the Gansevoort Plaza LPC testimony with the wonderful historic row houses. And I know also you work with, there's a wonderful group out of Chinatown called UA3, and they now have a Co Covenant Mercy, Mercy Mission and Manor Community Church. They've been working together and we've been helping them to get permits. Finally, I just want to mention something that I care a lot and you do too, which is our history. And so on Tuesday, June 16th, from two to four, uh, Rob Snyder, who is our uh, borough historian, is having a forum virtually, of course, on how to do oral history and how to somehow archive this God awful virus. So I just want to conclude, this is a tough time. And I want, I'm so proud of the community boards. Um, we, every time you think, you know, hospital, as the senator said, is going down in terms of admissions. Um, and then uh, you have a murder of a, an individual African-American man. And then you have uh, great protests challenging, uh, challenged by individuals who couldn't care less about the mission, but are looking for their own uh, grandizement. And I don't know for sure, but it does seem like they are organized by somebody. I don't know that, but it does feel that way because there are a lot of cars, a lot of illegal license plates and I don't doesn't seem to be it's random and then finally you just have you know how are we going to get back on Monday and we have been working thanks to the governor's office borough presidents labor business speaker's office and mayor's office to talk about that particularly retail retails Monday in addition to manufacturing and and uh, we're going to have a million calls I'm sure to the board and our office about construction but in terms of retail, right now it's not appointment, it is pick up whatever you ordered. Um, the stores are trying to figure it out. We would love to know if there are issues along those lines. And I think people wanna have the stores open because then of course you'll have less opportunities because there'll be lights and people and activity. Congratulations board four, these are really, really, really tough times. I don't think, it's not just COVID, it's everything else and people are angry and upset for a million different reasons and uh, particularly for young people, for children. It's, it's uh, hard to describe. Thank you very much, and um, your meeting is always fabulous. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. All right, uh, Gail, we have a question from um, Colin Wright, but before Colin speaks, we're doing a double check right now, but if you really wanna be proud of board four, Gail, I think all 50 members are here tonight. We should. That has to do with your leadership and, of course, Jesse Bodine. What a comment. Yeah, it has a lot to do with Jesse, I think. Um, but if I'm counting right and we're double checking that, I think all 50 members are here. Colin, you had a question for the borough president. Hi, borough president. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I wanted to thank you so much for your advocacy for 40 miles of emergency bus lanes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you know, and, and also a shout out to Paul Global in your office, who I know was working really hard on that policy. You know, as people return to work, we've seen a really discouraging trend of people dropping off transit and choosing cars instead. And as you know, the bus system carries frontline workers, low income New Yorkers, and we need to make sure that, you know, our buses are, are getting them where they need to go safely and quickly and reliably. And more green than, than single occupancy vehicles. So thank you so much for your advocacy there. Thank you, Colin. You know, I take the bus all the time. I love buses anyway, but they're free. I talked to a reporter today who lives in New York City. She didn't know they were free. 
And I asked Ms. Feinberg, who of course is in charge of everything, uh, Sarah, and she said she didn't know when the free was going to end. I think that's great news. So get on the bus and we just need more bus lanes. Thank you for mentioning that. And thank you for mentioning the great work that Paul Goble is doing. All right, thank you very much. Um, Gail, Dolores says her hand up. Dolores, did you have a question for Gail? Dolores always has a question for Gail. Dolores, there you are. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, Gail, I'm sure you're aware um, that DHS has been relocating um, yeah. folks in shelters. It seems to be that this community board is bearing a, a huge amount of those, uh, those shelter residents. It seems very haphazard. We are very concerned about the process. We want to be supportive, but um, I think not just notifications, but just in general, how operators and providers are being uh, pushed to very quickly move their folks out of their own communities into any space available. Is there anything that your office is doing at this time to try to help coordinate better so that shelter residents have the ability to stay within their own communities where they are more familiar with their surroundings and also have access to the services that they're used to? Um, yes, yes, yes. I'll tell you what the challenge is. We have this, you have 44th Street, which just was as an example. 40, I believe, I don't know if it's in Board 5 or Board 4. There's another one in 87th Street. There's a million issues. First of all, DHS doesn't tell anybody and really doesn't tell anybody because, quote unquote, it's conflict of privacy. Um, is my understanding. And again, I am not, uh, I, I've been complaining. That's what I've been doing. Uh, they are supposed to go, the individuals are supposed to return. Apparently there is a, 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 a discussion, but not an agreement between Department of Homeless Services and understandably uh, legal services in the general sense. And the issue is that people who are coming from quote unquote uh, congregate care are too close to each other and obviously uh, COVID. Now, I know in some cases they're not getting moved into a hotel, they're getting in, moved into a single room occupancy, which is not a hotel in my, in my view. So I am not sure that where people are coming from, where there was in one case that I know of, none, no COVID, if it's better. So I, I'm fighting it as best as I can. I can't tell you that I am 100% successful. Um, I know that the speaker is also quite upset about how it's going. Meanwhile, the, the, the quote unquote congregate shelters are just sitting there empty. You and I are paying for them empty. And in many cases, it's a preferable healthy wise, health wise and preferable uh, quality of life for the individuals. So I think it's insane. However, there's a, uh, you know, uh, two factions that cannot agree, the city of New York and individuals who like we all do feel that all congregate shelters at this time are not, uh, are, are not appropriate. So we can have a longer discussion, but it's, it's not just one or the other. There's two very challenging entities that are at each other's throat, how else to put it. All right, thank you, thank you, Borough President. Um, I see no other hands, so I'm gonna move on. We have another of our elected representatives joining us. Tina, are you waving at me or did you have a question for Gail? You got to go off mute there, Tina. Yeah, I know. Fan hands. Um, I am concerned, just like everybody else, about um, the possibility of, of groups coming over into our neighborhoods. Um, is the city working with law enforcement in any um, organized fashion that could trace some of these uh, people that are coming here with uh, alternative agendas? Um, I think that's a really good question. I, I have to say, uh, I think, the, I, let me just try to answer your question. The first night, I think they were caught, I, I don't know, you could check with your local precinct. I think they were caught by surprise, not with the individuals walking, but the individuals in cars. Because when I spoke to them, it's, they're very mobile, it's a car. So the cars would take off in different directions, and I don't know that PD was ready for that. 
can see. And so I must admit, when I toured Soho, and I heard this, and I heard the license plates were covered, that was organized. And there were a lot of them. And that's when I suggested, you can't have any cars coming in here because you can't chase them. Mm -hmm. So the next night, as I understand it, you have to get more details with still getting them. Almost no challenges in terms of what you're describing. So whether it was organ, it does seem organized to me, but I don't know. And I assume maybe, maybe NYPD has more information than I do, but that's what I know. It, it feels that way, that it was organized. All right, Gail, actually, I have a request. Um, you know, uh, the, our district manager holds a district service cabinet meeting every month. And Jesse, correct me if I'm wrong, but the people who show up least frequently are the NYPD. Um, and I think Brian had asked us this morning if there was anything you could help with. And I believe that, um, you know, Board three said the same thing. If we could get the NYPD to show up at the district cabinet, district service cabinet meetings, I think we could uh, work on some of these issues. Well, just to clarify that, that, just to make sure we have the facts, there's a seemingly a, 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 an issue with NYPD officers attending Zoom meetings not attending district service cabinet meetings. I, when we were holding in-person district service cabinet meetings, uh, NYPD, our precincts were always there. But I guess there is something internal, uh, uh, operational-wise, and I think it'd be great, actually it'd be very helpful if Gail's office could sort of get to the bottom of that um, and be able to, because Gail's office was great in getting us all Zoom, and we all use Zoom multiple times a day, if NYPD can sort of figure out a way of allowing their precinct uh, captains and command, uh, community affairs people to be on the Zoom meetings for the district service cabinet. I will figure it out, Jesse. I appreciate it, Gail. It, it, it's, it's one of those things that makes you crazy, me crazy, I, agree. I will figure it out. I agree. Right. Thank you very much, Gail. I'm going to move on now. Um, Council member Helen Rosenthal is with us. Council member. Let me get you Zoom see everyone. Um, glad you have almost full or 100% participation. So I'm just going to talk about two things very quickly. Um, one is the city's budget. Uh, you know, by law, we have to pass it by the end of June. I'm on the budget negotiating team and we're facing a $10 billion revenue shortfall and likely $3 billion shortfall uh, due to cuts uh, of state aid. So uh, we have our work cut out for us with a $83 billion, $93 billion budget that's over 10% of our operating expenses that we're going to have to figure out um, what combination of cuts, uh, program cuts, productivity, use of reserves, um, where can we find possible additional revenues. I still support bo borrowing. What combination of those things do we put together in order to uh, not have to cut our very important social service programs or start cutting fire stations again. Um, and that's a challenge and, and something that I have strong feelings about. If you're interested in reading um, my point of view on this, I think there are two very obvious state laws that we can change the, you can, I wrote about it in the nation. The easiest one to pass, I think, is um, one that would um, eliminate the automatic rebate of the securities transfer tax. This is a law that was state law put in place in 1905 to capture uh, a tax on uh, the moment when a stock is bought or sold, it's pennies to the dollar. Think about the fact that you go out and you, you buy toothpaste, you pay a tax on that. Uh, stock transfers, no tax whatsoever, only because in the 19, early 1980s, uh, they, made, they passed a law with an automatic rebate um, to the brokerage houses um, for that for that tax. 
that was only done in the 1980s. And it strikes me that because during the pandemic, the only group of individuals that has made money off it is Wall Street, the brokerage houses, with all those up and downs of the stock market, it strikes me that now is the perfect time to um, stop rebating that tax back and instead collect it. And um, um, by law, the revenues would be split evenly between the city and the state. And while there are bills in Albany supporting this, each of the bills were pre-COVID and they do two things. One, undo the rebate, but two, spend the money on different things. And I'm sure those are all worthwhile things. But right now the city is having a revenue crisis. If you think about going into COVID, the city was doing so well, the rating agencies had just improved the city of New York's bond raising to AA1. So we don't have a problem of spending too much money. Something happened that's out of the control of everyone. We have a dramatic drop in revenues. And I believe the solution should focus on uh, replacing that revenue loss. And you could even see the, um, although I don't agree with this, but if there's pushback, you could even see there being a sunset clause on um, unwinding the rebate until the city starts getting back the revenues that it was once enjoying. So um, we're in the middle of negotiating that. I'm getting lots of calls and emails to my office about uh, um, uh, taking away money from the NYPD and adding money to social service and human service programs. Um, we are definitely looking at cutting the NYPD budget, um, but my colleague, we're on budget negotiating team meetings pretty frequently, and today my colleague Lori Cumbo raised the point that you it's not meaningful to punish the police by cutting their budget by a billion dollars over four years. That's not the point. The point is to have them uh, be trained to uh, behave uh, appropriately, um, you know, so we don't have the situation that we're in now. Um, her suggestion is that they uh, are required every time they move transferred into a new precinct to put in 90 hours of community service, um, which I just think is a brilliant idea. This is a way to bring police officers into the community, get them to know what a community is like, what the community needs are. Um, so this is an idea that I'll be supporting um, all of which to say uh, there's a lot going on with the budget. Obviously, I'm sure everyone before me has talked about, um, you know, the disgraceful behavior by the Minnesota police killing George Floyd on so many levels and how the only way we're going to get out of this is by taking, um, you know, hundreds of years of racism and, and now the institutionalized racism seriously and, and really confronting the issues at hand. I always recommend people uh, to people that they read the 1619 Project um, written by, uh, I think it's Nicole Hannah Jones in the New York Times. It's just very, uh, very helpful set of articles. With that, I'll wrap up, answer any questions you might have. Thanks for having me. We had one hand up, Chris LeBron. Hi, Helen, just a quick question um, regarding budget. Um, so I know that there's, this is kind of like a stopgap. Uh, are, are there any bills being considered right now in city council um, that would be focused purely on revenue generation, like any discounts to Spectrum Charter and Verizon vans uh, so that they, that, I mean, like, are they paying their parking tickets in full to the city? Mm -hmm. um, because or like DH, DHL or FedEx or UPS, like, 
These are vehicles that are constantly in, in the five boroughs. They're often double parked. They're left idling. They have stacks of, stacks of tickets on them. Um, is the city getting its full share? And is that something that would be considered by city council to help alleviate the budget pressure that we have right now? So I'm just taking a note to look into that. I think it's a really clever idea. The city is so limited. Hang on one second. Um, The city is so limited in its ability to raise revenue, uh, um, but that is definitely within our purview. What I don't know is how we would unwind the contract that the city must have with those groups where we do um, give them a discount uh, when they submit their parking tickets. Great idea, I'll definitely look into it. Colin? I thank you so much, Councilmember Rosenthal. Nice to see you. Um, you know, training and de-escalation tactics for the NYPD are incredibly important, and I agree with Councilmember Cumbo there. But I think one thing that we have heard consistently over and over over the past few days and years is that actually there simply are too many police in New York City. Yeah. You know, I think that um, the we we shouldn't talk about it in terms of punishing. The NYPD, I think that we should talk about it in terms of in a time of seriously constrained budgets. Yeah. You know, a, a police force larger than the size of some countries, militaries really shouldn't be New York City's number one priority. It's not a golden goose. Thank you. And Thank I do you. appreciate your work on this. I don't mean to challenge you, you know. You're not. It's a great point of view, and I agree with it. We were looking at some numbers today that showed that as a um, – uh, that New York City is on par with Chicago and um, LA and Houston, I forget, one other uh, locality with how many police we have per population, 100,000 population. Um, I mean, I think, you know, New York City is always bigger in everything because we have the largest population. So it's hard to, you have to look at it as a, um, you know, in, in relation to other things. So, but I agree with you, you know, during my first term, I'll, I'm, I'll admit to it. I know when it happened, I remember the moment we were told about it, uh, that we were adding 1,250 more cops. And it was in Melissa's first or second year. <laughs> Jamani Williams and I were on the budget negotiating team. And I distinctly remember the two of us looking at each other and going like, what? Just where did this come from? Um, so, you know, we have the lowest crime uh, rate in the history of New York since, the, uh, what is it, the 50s? Um, there's no reason we need as big a police force. And um, we're actually looking into the details of how to have a route, uh, uh, to be able to have a route to a number that we can you know, stand on and feel good about sort of, you know, how do we look at the data and, and therefore, you know, come up with a number that we feel comfortable at it. The way that we would execute this is by delaying or, or ending um, or decreasing the size of a class. And um, basically what we learned today is that the NYPD has about a 6% attrition rate and they run four classes a year in order to deal with that attrition. Um, so they're always right around their budgeted headcount. Perhaps what we, what we were talking about today is perhaps eliminating one of those classes or two. Um, but again, I think it's important if, if we want to have a leg to stand on that there's a route to the number and that it be paired with um, uh, very tangible uh, changes in how the NYPD functions. Um, I have some ideas for legislation that I'm trying to put forward that would require accountability. I'm looking at the Campaign Zero website. I don't know if others have seen it um, for guidance. We need 
we need to do better. There's no question. I, I think Corey, Corey is saying this out loud as well. I, you're going to see the city council come up with something different. All right, council member, we have three other hands up and I don't think we have time to keep going through these questions. I know, and I have four minutes until curfew. Anywho, yeah. So we, you need to get home. Um, Bert, Sarah, Christine, I'm sorry. We've just got to keep this moving. You can reach out to council member Rosenthal directly. Yeah, you all have my phone number. Call me directly or just email me, helen at helenrosenthal.com. It's great to see everyone. Thank you for all of your hard work. Thank you very much, council member. We've got two reps of public of public elected officials. Um, hang on, I'm looking. Leslie from Senator Jackson's office. Leslie, do you have a quick update for us? Lowell, she put something in the chat about having an issue with her speaker and provided her contact info. I'm not sure if that's been fixed, but she threw that in the chat a few minutes ago. Okay, well then if anyone has an issue for Senator Jackson, her number is posted in the chat. Thank you for oh. that, Jeffrey. She also mentioned that she's doing constituent services for people who are having trouble with their unemployment. Okay, if, if, it's in the ch if it's in the chat, everyone, if you have questions for Senator Jackson, you can find that in the chat and reach out to their office. Finally, um, Kevin from the district attorney's office is with us. Kevin, you still here? Yes, I'm here, can you hear me? Yep. All right, fantastic. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kevin John Baptiste, uh, representing Manhattan District Attorney Cyrus Vance. I'll make my updates very brief and just try to provide as much information as I can. Um, the first thing I do want to focus on is, uh, since we are still in dealing with COVID, um, the office has received and been dealing with COVID scams and complaints, um, price gouging complaints, or people asking for personal identifying information. And, 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 and using that as a way to, to obtain people's information and scam them. Uh, we then created uh, an email line that allows folks to make complaints if they would like to, or if they think they've been scammed, uh, we can look into those complaints. And it's very simple to get to that email. It's fraudcomplaints at danny.nyc.gov. Uh, what I'll do after as well is, is, is include it in the chat, that way you can uh, jot it down if you didn't get a chance. Um, the second important thing that I'd like to bring up is that last year during this time, we had zero hate crime um, complaints or assaults against Asian Americans. And this year already we've, uh, we have 11 hate crime complaints that our office is either prosecuting or investigating. Um, and we're looking to really vamp up our campaign against hate crimes, um, try to bring the awareness around it, and just let folks know that um, hate crimes are not accepted in Manhattan. Uh, DA Van stands strongly behind that and has proven so through previous cases that our office has dealt with. Um, so I do want to share our hate crimes hotline once again. Um, that's 212-335-3100. I'll include that in the chat for folks as well. Um, and we'd like to also can do a, a, a campaign against hate crimes, whether it be via social media, and just try to really figure out what's the best way we can get the message out to, to people out in the community. Um, the third thing that I wanted to touch base on was domestic violence. Um, we know that during the pandemic, there were folks that were quarantined, possibly with a, in, a, in an abusive home. Um, and not many folks may feel comfortable coming to law enforcement agencies um, to report a potential domestic violence incident. So we created a, a really long list of different resources that folks can get in touch with um, anyone that serves uh, domestic violence victims including our hotline as well. So I do want to share that link uh, with anyone that's interested. I did send them over to all of the community board district managers. Um, and I, sh I would love to send that to anyone else who's interested. Um, luckily for us, domestic violence has gone down uh, so far this year throughout the pandemic. And we're hoping that it continues to go that way. Um, DA Vance released a statement on police brutality, knowing, of course, it's not accepted and condemned the actions that happened in Minneapolis. And I encourage you all to go on the Manhattan DA website uh, to read that statement. It's very long, so I'm not going to read it here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin. All right. Um, hour and a half, we've gotten through all the electeds. Let's get into the business meeting now. I will take a motion to adopt the agenda. 
So, All right, so I see. Mr. I, Chair, do we have to add the new business or does that come later? We, we can do that afterwards. We'll add that as new business at the end. So moved. And I saw a couple of hands for a second. All those in favor? Second. Anyone Aye. opposed? All right, we have an agenda. Minutes from last month. Any questions about or comments about the minutes? Not hearing any, I'll entertain a motion. Move to adopt. I see Joe's hand is second. a second. All those in favor? Anyone opposed? Aye. All right, we have the minutes adopted. We go now to our district manager, Jesse Bodine. Good evening, everybody. I'll be as quick as I possibly can. Um, so uh, similar to what was already reported, one of the things that we're doing in the office is getting uh, any report that we get about stores being uh, looted or damaged. We are making sure we are forwarding them to the mayor's office and to the uh, Office of Small Business Services, who I know is working on different ways to be able to be supportive as, as quickly as possible uh, to the stores um, and the owners. Um, I met personally, I met with uh, the new Breaking Ground community outreach folks, along with uh, Nelly Gonzalez of my staff, uh, um, of our staff, and um, uh, some folks from actually the local bids, uh, and uh, to understand what's the impact of not only COVID is having on their their work, but also the uh, obviously the curfew and the and the and the um, uh, the violence, and so. Um, positive news is that they're still doing 24 seven tours. They've obviously had to take it day by day as to terms of uh, where they can do those tours as to the, where the looting is happening and then where the police response is happening. Um, another good thing is they are bringing on additional staff um, uh, 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 in the pipeline very shortly. Um, so up, up to I think eight additional teams will be doing outreach. So that is good news. Um, uh, what else? Uh, just a very for uh, just uh, sort of uh, nuts and bolts. Uh, we're coming to the end of the fiscal year, so two out of our three contract contracts for a short-term consultancy have been closed. The other one is about uh, ninety percent done. Uh, so we should have them all closed out. I will say I'm very happy to say I think uh, me and Nelly have been tracking the money that we had gotten from the uh, council this year and last year. And so we've, we're gonna be spending almost 100% of it. Uh, and so um, on both the short-term consultancies, some, some office staff and equipment materials and some, uh, some uh, um, uh, 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 event stuff uh, to local uh, organizations. Um, so that's going on. So, so the month of June, um, all committee, uh, all June committee meetings, are going to be meeting at their regular date and time and will be held remotely using Zoom. The links uh, to attend all these meetings are on our website, on our calendar page. Um, and uh, so they'll be accessible. Um, and then I just wanted to remind people that July's full board meeting is held uh, at the end of the month on Wednesday, July 22nd. If there are any questions or anything, I can take them. Anybody have any questions for Jesse? Thank you, Jesse, for everything you do to keep this board running. Um, okay. Chair report. Inga. Inga uh, we have a question. Inga, you're waving. Sorry, I missed you. Go ahead. But you got to go off mute if you want to ask a question, Inga. I just wanted to, at this time, just pipe in and say that with the avenues, none of this would have happened without Jesse going behind the scenes and making things work. When I spoke to them, they spoke to me, Jesse kind of made things, he makes the connections that we don't really see. Thank you. Thank you very much, Inga. And it was a pleasure working with you. You too. All right. And if anyone else, if, if you've got questions or comments, please use the blue hand because I can't see everyone in their tiny little box. So I apologize for that. Um, not seeing any blue hands, I'm gonna move on to the chair report. Um, Jesse and I met with all of the new members one-on-one -on -one to welcome them to the board. Um, and we worked with them on committee assignments. Everyone who has not heard from me about their committee, you're returning to the committees you were on for 2019 and the first part of this year. I have contacted everyone who is being assigned, either moved to a different committee at their request 
and all of the new members. So, um, and I've let all of the co-chairs know um, who's on their committee. So if there's anyone who does not know what committee they are on, please reach out to me or Jesse and we can uh, sort that out for you, but that should all be done. Um, as was alluded to um, by the question Dolores asked Gail, there are a number of uh, shelters that are moving into hotels in our district. Um, we have met with DHS multiple times. We have met with the, sh the services providers for most of those hotels. Um, it is outrageous that we are not getting any notice. Um, we've started getting some notice you know, under the table um, after pounding the table enough times and yelling and screaming loud enough, um, but we're still not getting proper notice for that. Um, and we are going to continue to work on that. We attended, um, Maria and I, the Lantern, Lantern Stardom Hall Community Advisory Council last night. It sounds like things are getting a little bit better on 51st Street, um, but that's still a, an unknown. Um, future events, um, ACES is holding an educational forum. Um, Kit, did you wanna say a couple of words about that real quick? Yeah, happy to. Um, we have a forum to enable folks to engage around uh, how do we reopen schools when it's safe to do so. And we've put together a really impressive panel of folks with different backgrounds. Uh, the uh, spread is parents, CC, um, former deputy chancellor, um, and the executive superintendent of Manhattan are all going to be participating. And so we hope we can be part of giving folks a chance to get input on what they want to see happen schools are safe to open. All right, thank you, Kit. The sign-up's on our website. Um, I think I announced this before, but if I didn't, for those of you who don't know, Kit is taking over for Inga as co-chair with Alan of the ACES committee. Um, also on ACES, I believe there is a meeting being scheduled to help figure out how we can support local theater groups. Is that correct? Kit, Alan, somebody nod. Yes, it's true. Okay. I'm meeting next week. Okay, that's great. Um, in terms of committee work, Christine, did you want to say something and answer the questions we had earlier about the Open Streets program? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes, yes, I, I would like to do that. Just wanted to say that. Um, uh, Sunday, I went up to 51st Street and 9th Avenue, and so I have a little report on that. But clarification, first of all. So the program was announced by the mayor, and it was really a bottom-up pro program, which is driven by the individual block association. So uh, uh, there were seven, there were a number of block associations that, that applied, and there were seven approved in the, the, the district. And um, I'm happy to report that six of them have been working really well. So uh, the, the block at 51st Street uh, Association applied for it and uh, kind of to their surprise was, was granted right away. So that's the first thing, and uh, nobody forced them to do it. They thought it would, it would be a good idea and it would be a benefit to the community. Um, second, notification. The program has been under very, very fast and no one has been notified. The mayor would publish, publish a list like two hours or two hours the night before. And so, yes, the notification has been very poor, I agree, but in fact, it's nothing that any of us could do with. I mean, there was no memo, there was no email to the community board. I think there was an email to the block association and maybe not. And there, was, there were phone calls from the council member to say, hey, those have been approved. So it has been a little bit hectic on that standpoint. And um, um, I don't, you know, we have reported I have reported to DOT saying, this is no good. We can't turn on a dime, you know, on, from one day to the next. That's not a good idea. On the other hand, uh, the block association applies once the, the, the communication has done, has been to the head of the block association, that is the responsibility of the block association to make 
all the communication to the, the members, send an email, etc. I know that I personally worked with Steve and gave him some document that he could uh, uh, send around. Now, the, the specific situation there is that I know Steve is traveling and he's with his mother who is sick. So he's away from the block. And that specific situation was difficult, I, I'm sure, because he could have been on site and, you know, managing the, the block, but he was really absorbed by other issues. And so I think there is a little component of that on all these mishaps that happened there. And uh, finally, uh, the signage, DOT was supposed to provide signage and they announced that and they didn't. So um, what can I tell you? I'm, you know, we will communicate with DOT saying you didn't provide the signage. And finally, uh, the issue of people gathering and drinking in the streets. When I saw the picture that was circulated, I was not happy at all because uh, that was not the intent of that situation. Um, so I went up on Sunday night and on Sunday night, the street, the traffic was open on the street. So there was no open street, the traffic was open. And my observation was, and I have photos of that, is that there were people drinking everywhere. People were sitting on the sidewalks, people were sitting in front of bars. The people were sitting at every corner and when you would go down and there were no distancing, no masks, nothing. So, you know, I'm not surprised that the pro problem happened in front of Porsche. I mean, Porsche has not never been your, uh, you know, five star operation. But uh, I have to say that everybody else around it is the same way. And walking down Ninth Avenue, there were groups. Uh, 10, 15, 20 people in front of every bar with the same behavior, you know, groups together, no mask, no, none of that. And so I think the biggest issue we have here is the uh, open container law, which was relaxed in order to give a way of making money for the uh, bars and, and restaurants. And the idea was they would, take, they would take their drinks and people would go home. And indeed, that's not what's happening. People take their drinks and they drink it as a group in front of the bar. So I think that's the major issue. And I think that we need to communicate with uh, our senator on, on, the, on the laws on that. And I think the sooner we can cur curtail that activity, the better we will be. Because right now, the sidewalks on Ninth Avenue on the Sunday afternoon, we are not practicable. I mean, you know, I had to walk in the street all along. And if, if you are uh, uh, somebody at risk and you are older, et cetera, you cannot walk on the sidewalk. So, uh, so I think that's, that's what's going on. Um, I had further discussion with Steve Belida and um, we, we came, I mean, I suggested, but you know, it's, it's up to the, the block. If the block says, I don't want that street anymore open, that's fine. That's their control of the block. I suggested that he continues the uh, open street during the week and leave the traffic open during the weekend where you have, you know, Saturday, uh, Friday, Saturday, a lot more people drinking. And, and also uh, we have been reaching out to Posh and they have deployed uh, uh, garbage cans, et cetera, because that the other complaint was that uh, people were taking their container and then leaving them on the stoops and everywhere. So, you know, that's, that's not something that open street is going to change. So these are all the things that have happened in the analysis of what, you know, the diagnostic of what's the problem. And, um, you know, we have to rely now on the block association to uh, decide what they want to do uh, going forward. We have given them a, a set of tools and, uh, and then we need, I think we need this law about open container to be, you know, if there is an option to put table and seats in the street, and make money like that. I think the open container is, is really getting us to a situation that cannot be controlled because the governors say you can have a group of 10 people. 
So who is going to go and break the 10 people? We don't even know what the rule is, right? And we are not going to call the NYPD to come and break the situation. So it's really not manageable as it is today. I, 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 in regard to that, I just want to add, um, Senator Hoylman has proposed a bill extending the to-go sales from the bars. And at my request, the BLP committee is going to take right. that up at their June meeting and yeah. formulate a, a, a community board response to that. With open containers, it is a question of enforcement. Um, you know, again, that's an issue for the NYPD. Um, Sabrina, you had, I, I, you know what? I don't want to take questions now. We, we get bogged down on this. It's um, actually, well, oh, oh, oh. It, 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 sorry. It's actually an issue for the SLA. They are the enforcing agency uh, for, for open container laws. And um, I, you know, the, the bill that I carry um, that I introduced would extend the to-go and the delivery. I'm open to suggestions about maybe we just do the delivery and not to, the to-go part uh, of the bill, but I, I definitely want to hear your feedback. That's what you're going to get, Brad, because the BLP is going to take it up. Um, Sabrina, do you, do you have something you need to add on this? I really don't want to get into a long discussion about this now, but very quickly. We can talk about it later when we go into the agenda. Um, I live across the street. I live in 5th and 9th, so I've been living the whole situation uh, very closely. Uh, from the Friday, Saturday, and then Sunday when it was no longer there. Um, and I want to like talk about it. it's not only push, I mean, it's all the restaurants around it, so it'd be unfair to just point it at one. Um, and, and this is a problem that's going to continue happening if we have open containers. Um, it's complex because, uh, you know, it, 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 are we really want to help our business? We want to help give a break to our community as well. Um, so I think it's something that we really need to talk about and, and kind of try to uh, a solution on it. Again, I right. live across the street, yeah. so I, uh, yeah. And, and, and the committee will take it up this month and there'll be plenty of opportunity to, to discuss all of the viewpoints there. Um, the only other thing I will add is that, you know, what Christine said about it going on everywhere. Um, New York City is starting to look like the French Quarter with people out in the street with their drinks. Um, but BLP will formulate a response to that. Um, finishing up the chair report, as I mentioned during my opening statement, I want to convene a working group to deal with NYPD and race relations. Um, I'm looking for volunteers. Please email me or Jesse. Um, I don't need to see hands now. Just email us. And I am encouraging, you know, newer members of the board to please join us. It should not always be the same old people. Um, and then finally, I want to just remind everyone, June 23rd, there is a primary election and it is your civic obligation to vote, just as it is your civic obligation to respond to the census if you have not already done so. That being said, we're going to move into the letters of the agenda. Arts, culture, education, and street life has one letter. Kidder, Allen. Yeah, I think I'm taking this one, Lowell, thanks. Um, I think it's a pretty straightforward letter. Um, Gail Brewer mentioned the issue. Um, one of the programs that is potentially gonna be defunded is the Summer Youth Employment Program provides uh, job training uh, and employment to about 75,000 young people across the city. Um, we understand that the city is in a bind with revenue uh, disappearing, uh, but the letter strongly advocates for this program to be preserved at a time when young people are um, even more in need of uh, job training and gainful employment. Many of them are contributing to household income um, at a time when household income is going down for many families. And uh, we also encourage a landscape analysis and then um, a reimagining of what the jobs look like um, so they can be done safely in a physically distant way um, over the summer um, because COVID-19 obviously has not abated to the point where the types of jobs this program historically provided, um, which are largely in person is my understanding, um, would be safe and, and practical. Marty, do you have your hand up? Question? No, okay, he does not. Um, do, are there any questions about this letter? Betty? I, I uh email that I, I hope that you can strengthen uh, 
Kit and, and uh, Alan strengthen the letter by saying that the particular recommendation of the landscape program analysis would be designed to be um, have social distancing and other measures to protect the youth that are participating. That's it. Okay. Yeah. And Twee, you had a question? Just a minor question. There were two spots where um, the letter was addressed to and in brackets was the mayor's office. So I wasn't sure if it wasn't sure to whom the letter should be addressed. That's on, do you want where they're located? Sure. It's uh, page two, line 28, and page three, line 10, this bracketed mayor's office. I wasn't sure if that's the office you'll address. All right, we'll go clean that up. Um, can I just get a, a show of hands um, before we take an official vote? Is no, there anyone that has, gonna, no, um, no. yes, yes, Jesse. I, unless you're doing this differently, I thought we were doing it uh, as, a, as a bundle. I was just I was going to try and take it out of the bundle because I don't know if there's going to be a lot of opposition to the letter. So I was just going to try and take it out of the bundle. Okay. Um, but like we can we can do it the way we did it last month, and we'll bundle everything into one vote, um, one roll call vote. So we'll do it that way. So let's move on to BLP, Frank and Bert. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, these again are fairly uncontroversial. Uh, all four items are places that were previously licensed. So they're either changing their operation or a new operator is coming in. Item two is in Chelsea Market. Items three and four are uh, caterers for private events at the Google offices. So those are not even open to the public. And five is uh, one kosher steakhouse uh, replacing another. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Any questions about any of these letters? Okay, we'll move on. Waterfront Parks and Environment, Jeffrey and Marty. Good evening, everybody. Um, three letters before you. Um, item six, a thank you to Councilmember Rosenthal and our um, Council Speaker Corey Johnson for funding to um, restore um, a piece of art um, in Clinton Cove. Um, pretty straightforward, but we wanted to call out the thanks for that support. <clears throat> item seven, um, requesting that the um, ability to compost not be eliminated entirely in that we recognize that sacrifices are being made across the board, but that we do believe that there should be some opportunity for New Yorkers to be able to compost um, their kitchen scraps. Um, and then finally on item eight, a letter to the Hudson River Park Trust um, expressing the board's concern about the fact that Pier 86 is uh, really directly tied to the Intrepid's um, operation and that at a time when we're starved for public space, it is um, closed, much like the museum is. And we also call out the fact that um, um, the Intrepid um, in its lease negotiations are ongoing with the uh, trust and we believe they should be paying um, rent in accordance with other uh, park tenants as well. Any question? Oh, Lowell, that's that's your job. Yep, Blake. Yeah. Um, thanks, Jeffrey. Uh, on the intrepid letter, I I guess in committee I wasn't clear that we were weighing in on the rent component. You know, in addition to the peer opening, which I agree with the peer opening, not with the um, kind of getting involved in a private rent negotiation um, between these two parties and uh, you know essentially saying that a nonprofit like this um, should pay more rent, uh, particularly given that, you know, a lot of businesses could benefit from the additional tourist draw that uh, Intrepid could bring. So, you know, I wonder if we would consider stripping out the um, rent component. Well, the, the reason it's relevant um, is because the trust is a self-funding, self-governing authority. The only way they can provide us with our parks and piers um, that we love is through their ability to make revenue from their tenants, um, from any happenstance contributions from the city or the state, which are never guaranteed and are totally inconsistent, um, and then through fundraising efforts. Um, so, you know, it's long been an issue that the Intrepid Museum pays a dollar a year, much like our community boathouses do, which provide you know, free access to the water for free to the community um, or at low cost to the community. Whereas when you look at other tenants in the park, there are some pretty significant nonprofit tenants in the park that don't pay a market rent, 
uh, but they, they do certainly pay more than a dollar. Um, and given the fact that, you know, the peer is really directly tied to the Intrepid's um, ability to operate, it really is limited in its capacity to be a public peer. And that was just another reason we see as there being a need for an actual financial contribution in the form of rent to the park. Right. Joe? Yeah, the board is not interfering in a private contract. This is a public agreement between the trust and the Intrepid. And we have been long on record about this matter. And especially the board historically, the Intrepid kept the pier closed for a long time and have a lot of action to get that pier open. So it's not a new thing coming to us at all. I'm gonna add one thing just because I'm aware of this. Um, the trust is concluding its lease negotiations. It's been ongoing for seven years, negotiating a new lease with the Intrepid. And that will have to come before the community board on what the trust calls a significant action. Um, and it will need the, boards, the, the board to weigh in. So by telling the, the trust now that we expect to see the Intrepid paying rent, it's kind of a precursor to that discussion when, which should be coming up very shortly. Anyone else? All right, we're gonna keep this moving. I have a bet with Jesse. Thank you. Um, transportation, Dale and Christine. So we have uh, letters 9, 10, 11, and 12, and I think none of those is very, uh, the only one that we should discuss, obviously based on the comments I heard earlier, is the letter to Governor Cuomo about the Greenway expansion. Um, I guess the idea of the letter, you should know that all the other boards uh, bordering the the Greenway have already passed resolution similar to this one. And the concern is that in normal times, the Greenway is already completely saturated and conflicts between pedestrian and uh, uh, bicyclists. And there are information, there is a lot of information going on showing uh, a number of people buying bicycles and uh, bicycling, uh, move, you know, increasing, etc. And as we are recovering, we expect the uh, bicycling to increase. And third, all the other major cities in the world have started to roll out interim bike lanes to allow uh, the infrastructure for absorbing those new uh, cyclist. So this letter is essentially along those lines. Um, I think we would be uh, open to add a component of, you know, do a planning. Obviously, they are not going to do it without doing some planning. Uh, we are asking them to do it fairly quickly because of the COVID-19 as an interim, and that gives you a test for the future. And at the same time, they should make a larger plan to expand the Greenway. And so we could add a paragraph, a friendly, I, I've discussed a friendly amendment for that. So now we can open the discussion. Let's start with Alan. Uh, thank you. I would just like to add um, my concerns for uh, safety issues mm -hmm. in um, the same number of bikes and possibly more bikes into a lane that is probably uh, not as wide as the current lane and certain issues that I think we have in, um, in our section, primarily, primarily on 30th Street and 29th Street, which some of the other sections do not have. Uh, and I think that um, appealing to the governor with a letter to do something where may not see the, the, the light of day, um, we should know a little bit more about what's going to go into it and how this has to be done before we uh, suggest a uh, project of this sort. Thank you. Okay. Brett. Oh, no, I'm sorry, Hector. I skipped Hector. Hector, please. Hi, everybody. Um, I applaud the idea of expanding the bikeway uh, to facilitate the increase in bike tra uh, traffic and uh, pedestrians, but um, Someone had mentioned. Someone else on the council just uh, mentioned that uh, about the traffic issues that we're already having in the city, and uh, the Westside Highway is actually a main thoroughway. Um, very busy. 
it's already bottlenecked in certain areas. So my concern is, is to take up a lane to be used as a bicycle lane, which uh, raises some other safety issues as well. Um, I think it's a really bad idea. Honestly, I think there are areas that we can look into. Uh, this is a quick fix. I, I know we can just, uh, you know, cordon off a lane and have the bicycles go through there along with the pedestrians. But honestly, we need to look long term where we can maybe expand maybe into the pier docks into other areas where maybe the circle line is, where the waterway is. They, they take up huge spaces um, as, as it is. And I think that we should look at long term more permanent solutions than just taking up uh, the West Side Highway and increasing the more traffic and, and uh, causing more traffic issues in the city than we already have. All right, Brett. Okay. Um... So I was the uh, dissenting vote at committee, so I just want to uh, probably repeat a little bit what was said, but just try to lay out um, my position. So, so I, I support the idea of appropriately studying the addition of a new lane dedicated to bicycling in the existing West Side Highway, uh, including an opportunity for the state to hopefully fund an expansion and maintenance of a widened Hudson River Park, uh, which as we all know has been getting more and more congested as our community grows. So I, I'm very much in line with the spirit of the resolution. Uh, however, I am a planner. I'm certified by the American Institute of Certified Planners and I advocate for good planning. Um, removing a lane from the road that provides a major means of ve for vehicles to avoid driving through our neighborhood without first studying the impact on our communities is simply not good planning. Uh, changing the transportation network where motorized vehicles Bicycles, pedestrians, and other means of support uh, transport coincide with with coincide without a comprehensive safety study is, is not good planning. Um, so supporting the resolution as it's written, which asks for the bicycle lane to be created, uh, especially as it says to be done quickly, um, ignores the potential to achieve, to achieve similar if not greater goals by bypassing good planning. Uh, so I would recommend that we not support the resolution as drafted. Uh, rather vote against and then to advocate for a sound plan with similar goals and more input from the community. Um, time for study as soon as possible with the hope of implementation uh, after congestion pricing rolls out as legislation is scheduled for 2021 um, and the potential for negative unintended consequences I think could be minimized that way. Jeffrey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Christine. Um, just to add bad planning generally, the West Side Highway is actually bad planning as it really uh, provides a whole bunch of spaces for cars and really cuts off the uh, waterway for people, pedestrians. So beyond that, um, we are in a crisis. We are in a pandemic and we are going to be facing what is being referred to as a Carmageddon. There's no question about it. It's, it's already happening. For two months, I was able to cross the West Side Highway um, without a care of a car coming by it. And now it's as if all of the traffic has returned and yet we haven't even opened up for phase one. The idea that expecting things to maintain the same out of what we've endured for the past three months um, is, is just unfathomable to me, given the leaps and bounds this board has gone through to protect pedestrians, to protect New Yorkers, um, and make life better for those that utilize the street, not those only behind the wheel of their multi-ton vehicle. We are already seeing a huge surge in cyclist use in Manhattan. We're seeing it across the boroughs, and the city is going to have a major, major issue with the number of people who are going to be getting on bikes. We unfortunately have an administration that rejects the idea at all of planning for proper bus networks, of planning proper bike networks. And so we have to be acting in every way we possibly can to do everything we can for people who aren't behind the wheel of a car. And that means making more space for people on their feet with wider sidewalks and open streets, and most especially with dedicated bike and cycling infrastructure. Thank this you, isn't going to happen overnight. No plan is going to do that. And to, to reject this out of fear it's wrong at this point in time it, it is unfortunate. Sorry Thank, you. Thank you, Jeffrey. David? That's me, David Sullivan. I, I, David Warren. David Warren. Oh, okay, there we go. I just unmuted. Um, yes, Christine, and thank you for this letter. And Jeffrey, you raised some great points. Might I remind everyone that prior to the pandemic, 
um, it was crowded with pedestrians, the West Side Highway, um, and cyclists, because they put up, the, and they also poorly planned putting up the Jersey barriers to fight terrorism. So I agree with Jeffrey that the precedent is, let's have cyclists over motor cars, um, and to, this is a great letter, and I strongly support it. Um, and uh, true, obviously, um, you need planning, but in this case, um, there's been some planning and, and and going out of the pandemic and easing out of the pandemic, there's going to be a surge in cycling. So it's logical if there was a problem before the cycling, it's only going to be come before the pandemic. It's only going to be compounded between pedestrians and cyclists uh, when more cyclists are riding. You know, the cars, there's enough space and things like that for cars. They, they have so much. If you look at the real estate or the amount of space cars have with streets and connectivities, they have no problem. You don't need to worry about them. We need to be concerned about the pedestrians and the cyclists. Thank you. All right. Seemingly everyone on the board has raised their hand to discuss this issue. I'm, I'm not going to cut anyone off, but I'm asking everyone to please keep your comments as quick and, and as concise as possible. Jean Danielle. Yeah, I want to thank uh, Christine and Dale for the letter. I understand uh, the thinking behind it. And the questions are twofold. I don't know who um, first started this idea. It certainly was not the community in the West 40s and 50s. So I want to echo uh, Brett's point about considering uh, the impact of diverting cars into the West 40s and the West 50s if a lane is removed. I'm uh, not opposed to the idea in theory, but I would like to be that part of the consideration. How will that affect our little side streets uh, if this happens? Thanks. Thank you, J.D. Dave Holoka. Uh, you know, the uh, highway is, it's north-south, so if closing a lane of it increases traffic anywhere, it should be on the avenues rather than the side streets. Um, you know, I would point out that there's a national trend toward reducing lanes from these highways that were created in the Robert Moses era and its aftermath. And in fact, an external panel recommended reducing the BQE from six lanes to four that was endorsed by Sam Schwartz, known as Gridlock Sam, the, the noted uh, traffic expert. And he said that those added lanes that we had in the past were like uh, solving an obesity problem by loosening your belt. Uh, there is no ideal number of lanes for the West Side Highway. The more lanes you have, the more traffic you're gonna have, the darker our lungs are gonna be. It's a public health issue. And if you reduce the number of lanes, it's simply gonna reduce traffic. Only 25% uh, of people in Manhattan, of households in Manhattan, own a car and only 20% of those use it to get to work. That's 5% of the population and even that is largely discretionary. If you close those lanes, people are gonna find other ways to get around Manhattan or uptown and downtown. We're all gonna breathe cleaner air. Um, it's, it's the direction the world is going in. It would be a good thing to propose permanently, if you ask me. Thank Plus, you, Plus, during, Th during COVID, you, we've got less car traffic and we've got congestion pricing coming up, which is going to reduce traffic. Thank, Thank you, you, David. I'm just trying to keep this, I'm just trying to keep this moving. Sarah Appleton. Yeah, I will try to keep this brief because I'm also in very strong support um, of this letter. Um, I appreciate you know, this emphasis on planning, but first of all, there will be planning as Jeffrey noted, and second, we cannot let perfect be the enemy of the good. Bike ridership is up tremendously. It will continue to go up as people actually return to work. Our roads were already in cr at crisis congestion levels pre-COVID. They cannot accommodate people who are moving off of transit. We need to provide people with safe alternatives. And in fact, more cars will actually flood our side streets in our neighborhood if we do not give people safe alternative means of transportation to getting in an Uber. Um, because again, most people in Manhattan do not own cars. Um, so I just think there are so many good reasons to do this beyond that it's a public health and an economic imperative. And this is actually also very good long-term planning. As Dave just noted, I would also very much support this becoming a permanent fixture of our community. Thank you, Sarah. I'm gonna tell you right now, nobody after Inga is getting called on, so don't bother raising your hand. Um, Leslie. Leslie, you still with us? David Solnick. Got it. 
So what I worry about is with COVID, I'm hearing a lot of comments that some people will be afraid of taking subways and buses into the city because of not wanting to be in, in those confined environments. So people will be moving towards car, cars in the, in the city. So this is a concern I think that we should review is whether or not there'll be more cars as a result of COVID, people not wanting to use public transportation. All right, thank you. I was actually looking for Leslie Murphy, but thank you, Leslie Williams. Okay. Um, David Solnick. Oh, wait, Leslie Murphy, just, you gonna pass by me? I'm, I'll, I'll get you and <laughs> I'll get you at the end, Leslie. I, I know what you're gonna say too, so I'll get you at the end. I'll let you Don't wrap so up. Sure. I'll, let you, so, I'll let you sum up, David Solnick. Yeah, I just wanted to make one other point that hasn't been made, which is, you know, there are a lot of cities in the world, particularly in Europe, that have turned on a dime with regarding to uh, transiently, perhaps temporarily adding bicycle lanes. They have obviously done so without long-term planning, which I agree is necessary for long-term plans. So this is a short-term, this is a short-term plan. It needs to be done quickly, and there's no point in doing it if it's, if it's not done in that way. And it's the one instance in New York City uh, the one and only, you know, so it's really a very small, small percentage compared with our peers in other parts of the world. And, you know, somehow, it, it, you know, if, 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 if they can all manage to make it work, it's hard to imagine that we can. All right. Thank you, Colin. I'm going to skip you and I'll come, I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you sum up for the other side. Um, if that's okay with you, Brad. Yes, Chair. Sorry, I lost some power. Um, I just want to bring up the point of trucks. We stop the trucks, we get them delivered at night, we open up a lot of other room. And that's all I wanted to say, and I think that should be added. Trucks in these other cities, they deliver at night, it solves a lot of problems. Thank you. All right, Inga. I'll, I'll accept this one. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> Finally, something Christine likes. Inga, go Finally, ahead. you got one. <laughs> I just want to reiterate what Dave said and what Brad just said. And this is our unique opportunity to have something good come out of COVID. We can figure out the tweaking later. I think it's just, we should do it. Thank you, Inga. Wow. Leslie Murphy. Thank you all. Um, thank you, Christine and Dale. Uh, I think this was actually a very thoughtful letter and I do think it has the best intent um, and I'm not gonna go over the many, many points that I could because other people did. Uh, the physical danger of putting a bike lane on a state highway um, uh, escapes me a little bit. Uh, the complete lack of planning, environmental, traffic, professional or otherwise is um, a little bit concerning. Uh, but most importantly for me, um, and I think a lot of people know this on the inventor, uh, environmental side, uh, is everyone saying it's going to be better for the environment, better for the environment. It actually, if you look at these studies, they will have the opposite effect. Um, because what's going to happen is now cars that are going to be three or four lanes are going to be squeezed to two lanes and they're going to be longer idling. They're going to be longer in traffic. Um, you know, the bunch of people who are coming in from Stanford or New Jersey are not going to say, I'm not going in to work every day or to a Broadway show. And we already have the worst, one of the worst air qualities in the city. And this is going to be, it's gonna put it right over the top. But the one thing I, that concerns me most after all these points is has nothing to do with this letter specifically. It has to do that we are not listening to our residents. Um, I go to the community council meetings. I go to a bunch of black association meetings. I go to a lot of parent meetings. They do not want this. Um, some do, some do, and some, some definitely raise their hand and say they do, but a lot do not. And I think sometimes when ideology it gets away from us and we don't listen to our residents is when we're in trouble. So I'm going to vote with the residents of uh, Hell's Kitchen on this one. Thank you, Colin. Thank you. I, want to make, I want to make a point about this. I don't Chris, think... Chris, Christine, can I let you do this at the end before? Yes. All right, Colin. Yeah, thank you so much. A lot of really um, thoughtful and impassioned, you know, arguments for both sides. I would 
just like to reiterate my earlier comments, we cannot have people, we need to provide people with as many safe alternative forms of transportation as possible when they come back to the city post COVID. Um, you know, as a daily commuter on the West Side Greenway, I can tell you that there is a huge amount of unmet demand for space on the West Side. Um, and, you know, uh, I, I just, it makes sense to me. It makes sense to me moving forward, um, you know, and to the earlier comment about, you know, this, us not listening to the community. I mean, we're sitting here, this is the democratic forum for the community board to discuss the matter. And, you know, I, I, I just, I'm not entirely swayed by that argument. However, um, yeah, anyway, those are my thoughts. <laughs> All right, I had said I wasn't gonna take any more comments, but Dolores, if you keep it quick, I'll let you add in. When have I ever been quick? That's my fear. All right, no, so seriously, I agree with what Leslie, uh, girl Leslie, woman Leslie, sorry, is saying, mainly because we don't always have folks that are in the know about the community board and don't engage here. We are getting more participation now that we're in Zoom, so we may end up hearing dissenting voices. But most importantly, I think we continue to take a look at this lens in a way of, of thinking about what our needs are. We must remember that 9A is a state highway and it is primarily used by non-New Yorkers, meaning folks that bring their revenue into this city that are commuters from outside of New York. We do not limit them coming in because we add more space for us to walk. And this is anecdotal, but I'm hoping that there will be studies that come out. There are more people that are commuters that are not taking the public transportation. I have seen along the West Side Highway more luxury vehicles in the last two weeks, the high-end vehicles that are coming from the suburbs because they are not getting on the trains. And I think that that trend is gonna be here for a short term. If anything, we should be looking at having a study. And I will warn, as you well know, Lowell, having been very much involved with Hudson River Park Trust, having a study done on any state type of road, especially 9A, will take forever. So I caution that we, we have a myopic lens and we're looking only from the point of view of I live near the West Side Highway and when I walk over there, we're not the only users. We need to keep that in mind. Thank you, Dolores. Christine, final comments. I will say that we are going to take this out of the bundle and vote on this letter separately. No, I think my point was made about, uh, you know, uh, uh, participation of other people. I guess they are supposed to participate. Right. Okay. The platform. Thank you, Christine. All right. Thank you all for that um, very spirited discussion. I'm going to move to the Chelsea Land Use Committee, Betty and Paul. Yes, I think that uh, we have two items and they're pretty straightforward. We could probably bundle them together. The first one is item 13, which is um, on 23rd Street, a brownstone. They want to cut through the front facade for an air conditioning uh, grill for an air conditioner. And it's contrary to the LPC row house manual uh, policy, so we recommend denial. And then there's uh, 14, which is um, a extension of the bid, the flat iron bid, and it's a much larger area, but our community district is three and a half blocks that would be added to the expansion, and uh, we recommend approval of that. So I think it, it's pretty straightforward. Any questions? Seeing none, I'm going to move on. Housing, Health, and Human Services, Joe and Joe, you got this, or, or Maria? Which one are we doing first? You want to split them up? Let's do Lantern first. Lantern, my favorite. Um, hello, everybody. I miss all of you. I just have to get that out there. Um, sincerely. Um, I'm going to keep it short and sweet. I was going to go on a little bit more and give some background, but I'm going to try to keep it short. And Joe, you can add in because you know a little bit more history if necessary. Um, Lantern is, 50, is on 51st Street between 8th and 9th Avenue. It's an SRO preservation. Um, it's a development that made a commitment in 2009 
um, through the Western Rail Yard points of agreement between the mayor and the council. Um, in 2011, Lantern acquired the site. They're a nonprofit permanent housing social services organization. And uh, around that time, CD4 was extensively involved, including in a cab that Lantern had. Um, but that cab, that cab ended in about 2016 or 2017, I believe. Uh, fast forward to now, Lantern agreed to begin the cab again, and they began it in December because of concerns raised by residents on the block and tenants of the building. So uh, Lantern came before Triple HS in October and January. Um, and the concerns that were raised were the same both times, including last month when we discussed the letter. And the most significant um, concern raised is really about the few really disruptive tenants that seriously impact the quality of life for the residents of the block. For example, they describe screen that they're screaming and yelling all hours of the day and night that they have to endure violent and threatening behavior from their tenants hanging out in front of the building or on the block. Um, they talked about menacing passerbys, illegal drug activity, and they've talked about this going on for years and that it hasn't been addressed by Lantern appropriately. So basically the letter is just asking for um, uh, Lantern to reconsider their type of HRA contract that they have um, for, such socially uh, for such socially service needy tenants to do more, a, a more thorough assessment of the potential tenants that they're getting and to have a concrete plan to address each concern that we bring up in the letter at the next tab, which is July 7th. And also mentioned in the letter that I think is really important is the bigger picture here, which is that um, because of these unaddressed issues, this really negatively impacts the level of support the community has for affordable housing sites that have social services. And the other thing I just wanted to add is, Betty, I got your email for the friendly amendment. <laughs> so just want to right. know. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, so just want to note that when this project was reviewed and, and uh, reviewed by the board and approved, there, this was to be an SRO preservation project, meaning preserving SROs for existing tenants. And there would be some social services for homeless tenants eventually coming in as apartments and rooms became vacant. Instead, what happened is more than half the original population left and moved during the renovation. And then we find out much after the fact that Lantern seems to have targeted for service contracts, very social service needy tenants. And that was never the intent here. It was supposed to be preserving existing SRO along with support services for people who can live independently. So I think the project's gone in a different direction and it's impacted upon the block horrifically. And our meeting, the, there were 75 attendees at HHHS. The Block Association is basically driven to distraction on this. Although as Lowell reported, it may get better. I think our underlying issue is that Lantern is perceiving this as a social service facility and not a permanent supportive housing building with services attached. And we really need to bring DHS and get this back to what it should be. Okay, Joe, do you want to take 16 and 17 as well, please? Sure. So um, I'll do 17, which is uh, pretty simple. And that is we're basically looking to meet with Gotham and have a discussion about this issue of the utility allowance. In the Gotham buildings, there have been multiple locations and in multiple locations, tenants have received a utility allowance as part of their rent and their lease as part of the financing that happened with the buildings originally. These are all either 80-20 buildings or heavily supported uh, buildings through public financing. The New Gotham on West 45th and 44th is a building that was part of the Hudson Yards agreements for affordable housing. The tenants just began to see these credits disappear off their leases. There's a lot of back and forth. We got a lot of information from tenants about this being an issue. So we're looking to meet with Gotham and discuss this. And, be, and basically telling them, don't do this until you go through a process with DHCR. Uh, Gotham has reached out to the board this week, so we're hoping to set up a call to discuss that further. The other item is the WJ Hotel, Washington Jefferson on West 51st Street. And this was, again, a note that Lowell brought up before. No notice 
four o'clock in the afternoon, three o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday, and 143 residents coming from two shelters on the Bowery. Uh, and I, I want to note again, residents with multiple social service problems moved into this hotel on a block that already has gone through an incredible problem with some very poorly managed or run supportive housing or social service facilities. We have to say this at this point that Miriam noted it, the community's patience is really over on this and it's impacting any ability to figure out a way to properly integrate social services or supportive housing into our community. So the specific ask here is relocate this temporary shelter yet again to a different location where it will have less impact and it certainly never belonged on this block at all. All right, before I start with the questions, Maria, you have to disclose your vote change on item 17 and explain it, please. Uh, so item 17, um, at committee, I should have voted p &E because I live in the Nicole. So there's a conflict of interest. So for tonight, I'll be voting p &E. All right, so that's on the record now. Christine Bertay. Thank you. So this is very alarming and I, I was wondering why we are not asking the city to cancel their contract, cancel or not renew their contract with Lantern for those services that we do not want. Well, I, I, but Joe, before you, before you answer that, I can tell you, Christine, that that is the exact position that Gail Brewer is going to take. Right. I know, that's why, uh, yeah. why aren't we asking that? Because one of the first things, Christine, is we're trying to get a clear answer as to which contracts they have for which services. And there was a CAB meeting in which they stated that's confidential. It's not confidential, it's a public contract. So we're just trying to get the right information to make the right ask. But we, we can do a FOIL. I mean, you know, even if we don't have the information, we can send them, send to the city and say, it's your job. This, the, this type of contract we don't want to have. This organization has to be accountable first and foremost, because the problem we have here is there are people living in this building. They need services. And to go from one version of a contract to another, it's got to be a plan that gets developed. Otherwise, we end up with cancel the contract, and then you have people who need the services. So we have to manage it. I think, you're, I, I think you're at, you, your proposal makes sense at a later point in time once we have the information. Leslie Williams. Leslie, you're on mute. You're muted. There you go. There's the bingo card. I must say I'm pleased with the progress with this letter. Uh, I think it's a lot stronger than the previous letter. I do have a couple points to mention that I, I do want to raise. And one has to do with on line 32, it says what Christine was kind of alluding to. Uh, in a way, Lantern create a written detail plan to address and correct those aggravated problems. I think we need to take the word out, take the word address out and just use correct. They've already known about these issues for many years. They shouldn't be addressing them now, they should be correcting them. Uh, the second point I have uh, is regarding the community response on line uh, 20, 76, where it talks about uh, the building being rent stabilized apartments and uh, the quality of life issues and they can't uh, permit people coming in at night to visit tenants. If you have a rent stabilized apart, uh, lease, I would think, Joe, you can answer this question. Doesn't that permit the tenant to bring in people at night? Yes, the issue is, Leslie, is that this is an SRO, so many of our tenants are considered statutory. Although they're under hotel or rent stabilization, they may not necessarily have a lease. Okay, and then the other question that relates to this whole thing is, do we have a copy of their lease, a blank lease that they may have, so that we can review it? No, we should be, these are the, I'd like to get everyone add in, email Maria and myself as the documents we want to get from them. That's one of the issues we need to do to understand it's much, much, much clearer so we know how to act. Thank you. All right, thank you, Leslie. Brian. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, I just wanted to point out that there were two public letters sent in regard to uh, Gotham that sort of detail the situation in more detail. Um, so I'd ask just to um, maybe beef up the first paragraph with those details. Um, and just want to point out that the letter says FHA, I believe it's FHA and DHCR. 
Um, and otherwise, I want to point out that this involves low, moderate, and all middle income tenants in Gotham buildings. Brian, thank you for that. That was my error. Uh, we, as you noted, we received uh, two written testimonies regarding um, the Gotham utility issue, and I did not put that into the testimony during the public session. So thank you for flagging that. We want to note the only thing is that it's testimony we have to verify. Although we know the buildings were HFA financed, we have to verify the claims there before we start relying on them. OK, Patty? Um, for for the lantern letter, I'm glad that it is stronger, and um, and I was at this meeting. And it was very intense with the neighbors and block associations. Um, I, I, can this letter be addressed to HRA, and could it be addressed to someone above the um, director, who you seem to like a lot? But it seems to me that that we normally must, must Betty, be some kind of head person or something. Right, Betty, we normally write to the organization running the building and then copy the world. That, those CCs are not on that letter yet. I'm sorry for that. Uh, so could there be somebody above the director that-, that She's the, she, is the, she is the person in charge. Right, but isn't there the organization have somebody who supervises her or something? That would be the board. Anyway, it just seemed, it seemed just, you know, you keep focusing on one person and, and anyway, and can HRA get on this letter somehow, you know, all, copy the, it all the city, all the city agencies will be copied on the bottom. I'm sorry it was left off. Okay. And, and city council, right? Yes. Everybody in our normal stuff. All right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Maria. Um, executive committee letter item number 18. Jessica, are you still here? She is. Yeah. Sorry, having technical difficulties. Yep. Uh, I'm here. Um, thank you. We, uh, the budget committee met um, about a week ago and um, specifically was focused on providing an amendment to the letter that we issued and that the board approved um, a number of months ago in response to the mayor's budget. And in light of obviously the economic realities that the city is facing, um, you know, we understand that the city will have to make uh, changes and cuts, um, but specifically um, the budget committee, which had received feedback from all of the task forces and other committees um, of a community board for put together their recommendations for items where we really wanted to add our voice and say we have specific concern about these uh, additional, you know, or these, these few programs. Uh, so you have the letter there. Um, and I do want to note that we did receive some feedback um, from Blake, which has been added to make a slight change, um, very modest change just to the wording of the Sunday and holiday basket service related to DSNY. Um, but all other comments are certainly welcome. Now, Lil, you're on mute. Now I'm on mute. <laughs> Any questions or comments on the letter? All right, item 19. This is a joint BLP transportation letter um, that has been sent already. It is subject just to ratification. Who's gonna take this one? Frank, Christine, who wants it? I'm taking it. Bert. Yes, there sir. You go. Here I go. This letter did come from transportation and uh, BLP. We went back and forth. Uh, there was reason it went to um, exec and the exec passed it and sent it out was there was a time frame that we were under it was a deadline the, actually a bill was introduced last thursday into city council by speaker johnson and uh, council member uh, reynoso from uh, bushwick uh, this bill essentially what we decided to do with this letter is Knowing that there was going to be a bill before the city council, we wanted to say what our parameters were, what our limitations are, what we wanted to see. Um, we also understood that it's an experiment. What we're talking about is taking a lane, lanes from 
north-south streets, because we eliminated plazas, we eliminated parks, we do not want anything on side streets, just on the north-south streets. And if you read the letter, we identified certain, certain streets with a lot of restaurants that could possibly be applicable. We're not saying pick these streets in the letter. We're saying these streets might be appropriate, okay? These avenues, 9th Avenue, 10th Avenue, 8th Avenue, in certain areas. Uh, we're saying take a lane, take a lane out of the traffic, and to help the restaurants come back, because when they're opening up, they're not gonna be table to table the way they were. They're gonna have to have space and they're gonna have to have distance. And so we're saying take some space in a lane that was previously for traffic for parking maybe, and use that setting up tables. Um, and we'll go from there. We're not the only city that's trying this. Other cities are, are trying it. Something similar, I don't know if you're familiar what exe already exists. Um, they're sort of like tiny little parks taking out in other cities, Philadelphia has it, San Francisco has it, um, where they, people do set up tables from a restaurant. Um, I don't know if you, read the, if you read the letter, we're saying we want it not forever. We want it just between now, when it's passed, and October of this year. We want it evaluated at the end of the year, and even during the year, if there are problems. And we know problems of, by block associations, community groups, we get 311 calls, calls directly to the board. We will do our own evaluation as we go along and not wait until October. The operation would be from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. during the week, weekends to 11. Uh, and if we're saying if, there's, if they already have a permit for a sidewalk cafe and they want to use the street, they can't have the sidewalk cafe because we want to keep that sidewalk then open to keep that 12 feet, whatever the sidewalk is. Um, All right, Br any Br questions? Bert, Brett has a question, so I'm, I'm gonna let him ask so you can address that. Sure, yeah, there, there were two issues that were discussed at the Transportation Committee and I did not see them make their way into this version of the letter. Uh, one on the duration, um, the concern I would have with the way it's phrased is, uh, you know, this is, this is meant to help um, businesses operate when they can't be at full capacity because of uh, distancing inside. Um, I, I'm not comfortable with, uh, without having some kind of a stipulation on the whole um, recommendation without saying that this is terminated once the business can operate at, at full occupancy. Um, because once, the, once they set up, uh, my concern is then this becomes a new precedent, a new normal. Um, and uh, I think that needs a much bigger conversation before we say we give, um, you know, this is, this is okay for now until uh, till, till we, we feel a business is back to normal. Mm -hmm. um, that, was, that was one issue. So I would like, I would have liked to see the capacity, uh, the full capacity meaning that's when this program ends. Um, the other thing is uh, just a, a condition that a, a business can't have both a street location and also uh, a walk-up or take-out service on the sidewalk like a lot of the, the, the food uh, places have, have set up while they cannot allow customers inside the restaurant. So I'd be concerned if they had both takeout and the street that the entire sidewalk they might claim is clear because they're not using it for, for servers and whatnot, but in reality would be very congested. Okay. I think in answer to your uh, first point, Brett, um, we assumed that by October, it's not gonna be normal the way it was last year. Uh, we could be wrong, but I'm assuming it's not gonna be normal by October, but we definitely want it to end by October. We don't want this to be the new way of going about it. Uh, there have been proposals to, for two years. We said, no, absolutely not. And I don't have an answer necessarily to your second point. I would leave it up to, uh, well, let's see. We'll at least see what happens. And it's in the city council right now. Any other comments, questions? Oh, Katie, yeah, we got a couple of people. Katie? Yeah. 
Yeah, thanks. A uh, couple things. So, um, you know, we were talking earlier about uh, creating a bike lane on the West Side Highway, and we said, oh, it won't really cause traffic issues on the side streets. It would only be on the avenues. And now we're also talking about closing off the lane on the avenues near the West Side Highway. And as somebody who lives on 7th Avenue and 14th Street, I've already seen how nuts it can be on 7th Avenue. And I, I totally get the need for this, but it really makes me worry about how it's going to be implemented. Um, yeah, and I, uh, it, it yeah. really gives me pause. Okay, thank you, Katie. Inga? I think we have to try it. I think we have to help the restaurants. We have to keep the sidewalks open. And I just don't think we're going to be back to normal. And this is one of the only ways we can try to help restaurants, people going to restaurants, and still leave the sidewalks open for pedestrians. We need space. Otherwise, we're going to have no business and eventually never have traffic again because there will be no business. Thank you, Inga. Chris? Chris LeBron, you out there? <clears throat> All right, let's move on. Dolores. Um, so my concern here is the same as I had with uh, the recommendation for open streets, is that um, we've gone ahead and we've made recommendations. And again, um, I know that the best intentions are there. We use our institutional knowledge and what we have known for many years when we've done studies for other issues, transportation wise and BLP wise. But I am concerned that we make these types of um, uh, judgments and we memorialize them in a letter, uh, which can suggest for folks that don't understand exactly what the role of a community board is as advisory, that we've done at least the work that needs to be done to determine if these are appropriate locations. And even if we're saying they're recommendations, um, I worry about us without having the appropriate input and the appropriate um, guidance uh, from those that know the, the, the traffic patterns, et cetera, uh, with us putting those specific sp uh, places in our letters. Thank you, Dolores. Joe? I just want to say that we're going to make mistakes and this is imperfect and we just just accept it. We're going to not get this right entirely. It's going to be wrong part of it. It's not going to work exactly. We are all improvising here. So for anybody who has misconceptions or fears, you're right. It's going to be a mess in some places. It's going to work or not. We really have no choice. We have to move ahead as a city and we have to just go on with something like this and then correct the mistakes when we find them. That's all. Thank you, Joe. Sabrina. Yeah, I want to echo that. I, I think that uh, our city really needs our restaurants and also our people need to go outside safety. And I know that, yeah, there are concerns with traffic, um, but that's not, that can be solved. Um, I'm afraid that like Inga say, like at some point we're just not going to have traffic anymore. David Warren. Hi, yes, um, I totally support this letter and Joe raises very good points, but I just would like to say, let's keep this in mind, cars over people or people over traffic, however you want to phrase it. And I think that's what we have to look at as a community board and we can always tweak the mistakes. And thank you again. All right, I've got an unidentified MCB4 member and I think it's Morgan based on the initials. I did not uh, want to speak. All right. Well, this, was, was I me? just saw it says there's an MM up there, so I thought it was you. Oh, nope. So I'm not sure who that un unidentified That's person me. is. I'm on my mobile. I apologize, Lowell. Uh, my laptop restarted. It's Chris LeBron. All right. Go ahead. Oh, no. I, I'm, uh, I'm definitely voting for this bill. Um, okay. That's all I want to say. Uh, I think Joe laid it out clear. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, I just want to remind everyone that one's for ratification. All right, new business item number 20, Christine. 
or Dale? Yes, we, uh, uh, this is a project you are all familiar with that the community board has undertaken with funds from the um, uh, additional funds we received last year. We did a study of four intersection where we felt that the, uh, uh, you know, the crossing of the street was dangerous and uh, the crossing of the street could be shortened for various reasons. On 17th Street, we had, uh, it's at Fulton Houses and we have, we had two people killed there at 25th Street, very, um, uh, it's close to the Heliot Chelsea. At 43rd Street, it's close to Manhattan Plaza, which has a lot of seniors. 25th Street is also close to Penn, Penn South. And 45th Street, we also had two people killed uh, there and people are turning very fast. So we have paid for the study. Uh, Sam Schwartz has concluded that these were feasible and now we are sending a conf confirming letter to DOT saying we want to move with, move with it. Any questions on this letter? All right, and I am introducing new item, new business item number 21, as I laid out in my opening remarks, um, very similar to the, to the letter Assembly Member Godfrey and Senator Hoylman sent, a letter to Mayor de Blasio, um, basically stating that the police, the NYPD should be used to protect our property and citing, specifically citing the incidents in Chelsea on Monday night and to leave the protesters, the peaceful protesters alone. Anyone have any questions or comments? Yeah, I, I, Go I'd, ahead, like, Christine. I'd like to add that they should be protecting people, you know, I, I mean- that's, People and property, okay. The job is to protect people, not to attack people. So I think it looks like it's a little upside down right now. And, and people first and property second, but protecting is uh, people in my mind is really top of the mind. Okay, thank you, Christine. All right, not seeing any other hands. Let's move to a roll call vote. We're gonna vote on item number 10 separately first. That's the West Side Highway lane closure for bikes. Um, Maria, or, who's, do, who's doing the roll call tonight? Is it Maria or Mike? Or are you doing this together like we did last time? Do it together, Mike. Right, that's Mr. Noble. Mr. Yeah. Noble, the floor is yours to call the roll. Okay, you want me to call the roll? This is just for item 10, everyone. Okay, <clears throat> let me get to that uh, sheet. One moment, I have it. I'm ready. Well, I've got it. One sec. <laughs> all right, well, the one thing I want to remind everyone also is you have to also fill out the um vote sheet online so we have a written record. I think the link has already been posted in the chat. It was in your email. It was in the, the original um, note that Jesse sent out with the meeting invite. Where's the link? <laughs> Jesse, can you repost that link again? Roll no. up in the chat. Okay, it's fine, I'll do it. Thank you. Mike, the floor uh, is yours. Please call the roll. No, uh, Maria, go ahead. I, I, have, I can't get to the page. Okay, I'll do it. Um, so I apologize in advance if I mess up your name. I'm going to try. Sarah Appleton? Uh, yes, in support. Christine Berthe? Yes. Gwen? I don't know how to say your last name. Billig. Gwen Billig, are you with us? Thank you. Gwen Billig? She was here. Looks she's like she's here, slogging. She's here, but she doesn't have access to a, a microphone it looks like so i'm gonna move on i'll go back to her leslie murphy no on 10. i'm sorry she voted no uh byron viren yes viren yes viren yes. votes yes patricia i vote yes okay jessica Jessica Chase. Jess. All right. Move on, Maria. Dale. I'm a yes. Judith. No, I'm going to vote no. Martin. No. Paul. Yes. I'm yes. Yes. Paul, Paul Devlin votes yes. Tina. 
Yes. Keith? Uh, yes. Brett? Williams? No. Is that Williams or? No, no, hang on. Who, was, who were you asking, Maria? I think you're Brett up to. Brett Furfer. Brett Furfer, that's what I yeah, thought. Okay. No. Brett votes no. Azora? No. Wendy? Yes. David? Yes. Frank? Yes. Josephine? No. Lowe? Yes. Blake? Yes. Bert? No. Christopher? Sorry. Chris? Yes. Yes. Jeffrey? Yes. Elizabeth? Oh, Betty McIntosh. Yes. Yes. Morgan? Yes. Sarah? Yes. Raksha? Yes. Michael? Mike Noble? No. no. JD? Jean Danielle? No. Put him no. down for no, right? J JD votes no. Maria, that would be me. I'm going to vote. Yes. Alan? No, 110. Brad? Yes. Rhonda? Okay. Sweet? Yes. Joe? Yes. Sabrina? Yes. Dolores? No. Brian? Yes. David? David yes. Warren? Solnik. David, David Solnik. David Solnik. David Solnik, yes. Katie Stokes? No. Kit? Yes. Martin Treat? Yeah. And Hector? No. Rob Walker? Rob? Rob's Rob. on the phone. There he yes. is. Yes. Rob yes. Walker votes yes. James? James Wallace? Yes. Thank you. David Warren? Yay. Leslie Williams? No. And All right. Right? I'm sorry, say again, Maria. Colin. Colin Wright. Yes. Jessica, then, Jessica Chait votes yes. She indicated that in the chat. Gwen, what about Gwen? Gwen Billig, are you with us? I can't believe you guys took me off the vote list already. Ah. Oh, oh my God. Sorry, I'm Inga. Cry. My apologies, Inga, that was my fault. Inga, where did Inga. you vote? Yes. Yes, thank you. And I just needed, uh, Gwen wasn't there and Rhonda. Gwen and Rhonda, last call for votes. Rhonda was yes. there. Yes. Okay. Who was that? Rhonda. That was Rhonda, okay. Thank Rhonda you. votes yes. Gwen, last call. If you can't hear us, you can post it in the chat, Gwen. We can, we can follow up with her online vote tomorrow if we need to. All right. To. All right. What's the number? What's the tally, Maria? Oh, you're gonna make me count back to okay. I'll just tell you the numbers yeah. right now. Okay. <laughs> One, two, three. Christine, you won. What's the number? You won, you know. Please, please, oh, please. Personal. Yeah. Bingo. How many? Maria, how many no's? Fourteen. Fourteen what? no's. So the motion carries the letter it goes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Now we're gonna do another roll call on the rest of the items. This is on items. 1 through 9, 11 through 21. Same process. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm going first. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, give me one second. Sarah Appleton. Muting everybody. In yep. Okay. All right. I'm going to start. Maria, you have to unmute yourself. Jesse muted everyone to shut off the ambulance. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start at the top. Sarah Appleton. Yes. Yes. Christine? Christine, you're on mute. There yes. You go. Gwen, um, well, Gwen, we'll go to Leslie Murphy. Yes. 
Byron? Yes. Yes. Patricia? Yes. Jessica? Yeah, yes. Jess oh, there you are. Okay. I was going to say please post it in the chat, but there you are. Jessica votes yes. Dale? Dale, you got to take yourself off mute. Sorry, I thought I did. Yes. Judith? Yes. Uh, Mark? I don't know yes. Thank you. Yeah. Marty DeCat. Marty, thank you. Paul. Yes, son of all. Tina. Yes. Keith. Yes. Brett. Uh, abstaining at twenty-one. Yes to all the others. Abstaining twenty-one. Got it. Yes to all others. Elzora. No one's 16. No one's 16. Okay. And yes to all others. Wendy? I'm present, not eligible on number three and number four, but yes to all the others. Three and four, and yes to all the others. Got it. David? Yes to all. Yes to all. Frank? Yes to all. Josephine? Josephine Ishman. I was on mute, sorry. Yes to all. Thank you. Wool? Yes. Blake? Uh, no one eight and yes to the others. No one eight, yes to the others. Got it. Bert? Yes. Chris? Chris, Chris LeBron? Yes on all. Jeffrey? I'm present, not eligible on two, three, and four. Otherwise, I on all. Got it. Betty? Yes on all. Morgan? Yes on all. Sarah? Yes on all. Um, Raksha? Um, I'm about to be difficult. So okay. I'm present not eligible for three and four. He and me, three and four. Uh -huh. And then I'm voting against 13, 15, 16, and 21. And then 13, 15, 16, and 21. 16 and 21. Got it. Thank you. Mike Noble? Yes to all. Got it. JV? Yes. Yes. Uh, I, so I am next. P and E for, I think that was number seven, seven, 17, Maria. And yes to all. Alan? Yes, all the way. Thank you. Uh, Brad? Brad Pascarella. I'm abstaining to two, three, and four, and vote yes for the rest. And yes for the rest. Rhonda? Whoops. Yes, to all. Thank you. Twee? I'm abstaining for one, three, four, five, as well as 16, 17, 19 and 20. I'm saying no to item two, as well as item 11. And the rest is yes for item 21 that was just added. I put in a note in the sheet as to seconding what happens with the council. Okay, so I got, for Twee, you're abstaining one, three, four, five, and you're saying uh, no to two and 11. Um, I'm also abstaining to 16, 17, 19, and 20. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, Joe? Joe? Okay. I will go back to Joe. Sabrina? Yes to all. Thank you. Dolores? No one 10, no one 11, no one 12, no one 14. 12, 14, uh-huh. And no on 19. And no on 19. Got it. I don't understand what all these numbers are. Okay. Christine, you're not on mute. Brian? I'm mumbling. Brian? <laughs> it's a real meeting. <laughs> this is stupid. <laughs> Brian? I, I think that's me. I can't hear it. Hey, hey, who are you up to, Maria? I'm on Brian. Brian's okay. 
PNE 17, yes to the other. Got it. David? David Solnick? Yes on all. Katie? Yes on all. Got it. This is Katie. I'm abstaining on number 15 and yes to the rest. Got it. Kit? Yes on all. Martin Tree. No on seven. Yes to the rest. Thank you, Mark. And almost done. Hector. Uh, no on number eight. Yes to everything else. All right. Rob? No on number two and yes to everything else. <laughs> James Wallace. Black Lives Matter, yes to all. <laughs> uh, David, David Warren. Yay to all. Leslie William. Abstaining on 15 and yes to all. The rest. 15, yes to all. Colin, last but certainly not least. No one 16, yes to, all. Yes to the rest. All right, and the last person I'm... <laughs> Two last people, Joe and Brian. Uh, I'm sorry, just Joe. Joe, are you there? I think I saw Joe leave the meeting. Maria, do you have me? Inga, I have you. You went. All right. All right. a normal meeting. If did Joe we, did I, we leave? We lost Joe Restuccia. We lost Joe Restuccia. Joe just rejoined. I saw him rejoin. leave. Joe the just rejoined. Hang on a second. Joe was having computer problems. Joe, can you hear us? Joe, I love you, but you're He's holding us on. up. You're He's you're holding on. us up from finishing this meeting. He's coming on. Give him a second, please. Yep. Lowell, did you already lose your bat? Uh, Thirty-two minutes ago. I thought so. The, the the minute we got to item number ten, I lost my bat. I figured that. All right, Joe's here. If he can unmute himself. <laughs> Mr. Astucia, how do you vote on the rest of the package? Yes, I tried so many times to get back. <laughs> Can I, All right. um, Lowell, uh, there's yes, someone that has their hands up in attendee yeah, with a phone number. I would like just to make sure that that's not Gwen trying to call in. Okay. You can unmute them. Hi, 212 number that ends in 414. Identify yourself, please. It's Gwen. There that's you go. Gwen. That's what I thought. You see, I I'm taking up two lines. I mean, All I right. have to be somehow because I, what I'm getting is I'm getting the picture on my computer and then I'm talking on the phone. Good, that's good. Gwen, okay, Gwen, how are you voting on, on, first, how are you voting on item number 10, which was the letter to Governor Cuomo about closing the lane of the bikeway, closing the lane um, of the highway for, for, the, for bikes? I think I'll vote yes on that. Okay, and how are you voting on the rest of the package? I'm for it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good. With that, if there is no other new business, going once, going twice, we are adjourned. Thank you all very much. I will miss you all. Bye. Bye. Have a good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. 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 Good night, everybody.